I, I must confess I don't have a lot of detail about where it's headed right this moment or what it is doing, but we will keep you posted on its progress as it steams along the East Coast. CNN's continuing coverage of America Under Attack will resume in just a moment. This is CNN. Southern Manhattan this morning, still smoke billowing from what is left of the World Trade Centers. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency now saying there is nothing dangerous in this plume that continues to hang over the city from the aftermath uh, of the attacks on the World Trade Center. The EPA has already tested for lead, asbestos, and other organic compounds. They tell us there are non-detectable levels. Uh, that's not very comforting to New Yorkers, who uh, many of whom are actually smelling this stuff now. The winds have shifted and, and blowing uh, some of these particles uh, to other parts of the city right now. But once again, the EPA uh, claims it, it, had, it has tested for, for this stuff and says there's nothing to worry about. You're looking at a shot now at uh, the round-the-clock uh, um, rescue efforts uh, that are still underway. Uh, a chilling interview about an hour ago suggested that there may still be people trapped inside. A man from Toronto last night actually getting a page. We don't know whether it's an accidental page or a business associate of his uh, from the United States who called him. But a man saying, I am alive, I am alive, later on in the page saying, we are alive. The city and federal agents are taking this very seriously. Uh, you've got search and rescue teams, specialized teams that have come in from all over the country to assist uh, the, the metro uh, workers here. Uh, the mayor confirming this morning that so far at least 3,700 people are missing. Over 300 firefighters among those, among 30, uh, 330 uh, various police officers from various organizations across the country. Uh, this comes at a time when uh, three of the local airports here are opening, but in a very limited way. Uh, the first flights to come in here today will be those flights that were diverted from New York City on Tuesday. Public schools are open. They got a late start, allowing administrators and teachers to sit around and discuss exactly uh, what they will tell their students today. Uh, the, the major stock exchanges may open as early as tomorrow, perhaps though so, um, on Monday if that doesn't happen. Uh, but the city is doing everything possible to create a corridor now uh, to allow traffic to proceed south of 14th Street where businesses today continue to be closed. Uh, but even if wanted to, people wanted to get down to Wall Street right now, they couldn't because the west side Highway, which is the main artery heading south uh, from this part of the city, is now being used as a staging area for all the rescue workers and police officers who are assisted in assisting in, in uh, the cleanup effort and uh, the rescue efforts. There is a lot of news to report on the investigative front. Uh, you may remember yesterday, federal agents took uh, a number of men into custody in places as far-reaching as Providence, Rhode Island, Vero Beach, Florida, other parts of Florida, and, and Boston. Uh, Eileen, it is my understanding those men have been released, but they have indeed provided investigator with, investigators with some new information uh, that, that might help speed up the process of this investigation. Well, indeed. But first, of course, Paula, we actually have a major development. Um, we are being told on the ground, CNN Susan Caniotti in Vera Beach, Florida, is being told on the ground that Adnan Bukhari, uh, who was a pilot training in Vera Beach, he described himself as a Saudi pilot. You see him here. He is alive, and he is cooperating fully with the FBI. Now, we know that Mr. Bukhari was speaking or that was negotiating with the FBI to be brought in. We were told that by a rooms-to-go salesman who called us after seeing our picture of Bukhari on our air. He called Susan Candiotti and also inside of the apartment that the FBI searched that Bukhari lived in in Vera Beach, the FBI left behind receipts indicating that they, in fact, had taken a rooms-to-go furniture receipt uh, from that apartment. Now, the rooms-to-go salesman said that Bukhari was in his store on Tuesday, bought furniture for 
uh, exportation to Saudi Arabia. I also know from a law enforcement who told a law enforcement source told me there was an operation of federal agents went to the port in Fort Lauderdale on Tuesday night. Uh, and also the rooms to go salesman said he called the FBI and they told him don't worry we are negotiating with Mr. Bukhari. We now know he has been brought in and he is fully cooperating with the police. Now we also know that German police tell CNN they've detained a male airport worker. They've brought in a woman for questioning in connection with Tuesday's attack that is in Hamburg. Federal law enforcement in the United States was led to the Hamburg connection by way of information gleaned from a car seized at Logan Airport. It was a Mitsubishi. It was rented by Mohammed Atta, who lived in an apartment in Hamburg that the police have searched. Inside was a flight manual and Arabic language material that law enforcement investigators say was very helpful. Atta's driving records indicated that he lived here at 10001 West Atlantic Boulevard in Coral Springs. Sources say that uh, and we have, indicate, we have obtained Ada's driving records, and they also indicated that he lived at other addresses in Coral Springs. Police interviewed Charles Voss, who housed Ada, and another man, Marwan al-Shaki. Al he actually worked at a flight school that they attended. They were, uh, you know, like I said, students, and they, they arrived over there a you know, year ago. It was in last July. And uh, when they first arrived, uh, they had no place to stay. They just popped in pretty much, uh, as I recall, unannounced. And uh, so we provided them, uh, for the benefit of, of the flight school, uh, provided them a place to stay for a few days. So now, they attended this flight school, Huffman Inter Aviation International, a flight school in Venice. Now, we are being told by law enforcement sources right now that Amir Bukhari, the brother of Adnan Bukhari, actually has died last year in a small airplane crash. But uh, originally, there were pe uh, the FBI was on the lead of the Bukhari brothers from that Portland uh, car that they impounded. Paula? Eileen, uh, the Attorney General John Ashcraft was on the air earlier this morning and uh, couldn't, wouldn't really characterize whether any arrests are near. Given uh, this cooperation now that you're describing between Adnan Bukhari and authorities, do you expect or are you led to believe any arrests are expected anytime soon? Well, we know that um, these people are, were being sought as material witnesses. They can be detained, you know, Paula, as material witnesses for a while and then they could be arrested if enough in evidence is brought forward on conspiracy charges. We're getting this information that he's actually in custody just seconds ago. And so we do not know what kind of information he is in fact supplying, but everything does look very suspicious. That Portland, Maine car was rented at Logan, driven up to Portland, and it was rented according to documents by that the FBI at least looked at or law enforcement looked at that led them to these Bukhari brothers. Also, we know that those two men who took that car to Portland were on a U.S. air flight from Portland to Logan right before the uh, American and United planes took off. And they are convinced that those two men were at least some of the hijackers. Now, they've reviewed cameras at that airport. So now what they're going to have to do is match up pictures of these brothers to those uh, pictures, obviously. And they're also obviously looking at associates of these two men. That's where you're going to see the leads taking place now with Adnan Bukhari giving up more names of potential pilots, Saudi pilots, that were uh, trained here in the United States. Paula? All right. Well, thanks so much for bringing that to us, Eileen. Uh, keep working those telephones, and we'll keep on coming back to you. Thanks so much. And let's go back now to Miles, who's standing by in Atlanta. All right. Thank you, Paula. We're going to shift our, our sights a little bit toward the Middle East. Uh, yesterday, the leader of Pakistan, the military leader of Pakistan, General Pervez Musharraf, pledged unstinted cooperation with the United States as it tries to seek uh, the suspects involved in this attack. That's a significant point in as much as Pakistan, at least the allegation has been in the past, Pakistan has offered at least some aid and assistance to the Osama bin Laden organization. Joining us now from Islamabad is CNN's Tom Mintir to give us a sense of uh, further response which may be coming from the Islamabad government today. Tom. 
We were notified just a couple of hours ago, Miles, that the government spokesman was going to hold a press conference uh, here at the Marriott Downtown Hotel where we're staying. Uh, what we've heard in the last few minutes is that he thought this was going to be a background briefing. The cameras were not going to be allowed in. So they're debating now whether to allow the cameras to stay in. What we heard from the Pakistani president through the American ambassador uh, was, we are with you. And it was repeated several times. What we're waiting to find out is what we are with you really means. And I think the U.S. government is probably wanting to know what it exactly means. Uh, Wendy Chamberlain, the new ambassador to uh, Pakistan, spent more than an hour with the Pakistani president behind closed doors in the discussion. There was a call from the U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell last night to the Pakistani president. He also appeared on national television saying that uh, they deplored terrorism and would support the United States. So uh, we have to wait and see what that support is. Uh, as you know, Pakistan is only one of three nations that has relations with the Taliban, and I think the U.S. would like to use Pakistan uh, as a mediator to get their message into the Taliban and find some solution to this crisis if Osama bin Laden is indeed implicated in this. So we're waiting to hear from the Pakistani government. We don't know if that's going to be allowed before cameras or not. If it is, we're going to try to bring it to you live. Miles? Tom, do you have the sense that there are enough moderate forces inside the government in Pakistan to, to serve in that role? Uh, I mean, after all, when you're dealing with the Taliban, you're dealing with a very secretive, difficult organization. I guess obtuse is the word. Uh, is this the appropriate channel, do you think? Well, you know, it creates a lot of domestic problems if the United States is assisted in this. Uh, but there are a lot of Is Islamic fundamentalists here in Pakistan who would not agree with supporting the United States in any military effort against Afghanistan. Uh, there are even uh, supposedly a couple of training centers uh, inside Pakistani territory that are a real problem for the Pakistani government if they're going to be dealing with the United States in, in planning for some kind of military action if it comes to that. So domestically, there are serious problems that exist if the, if the Pakistani president president decides to side in this with the United States and we'll have to wait and see what happens on the streets of Islamabad in the coming days uh, as this is more widely known. Uh, Tom, as you've been know, there talking, really Tom, no statement uh, on local television. As you've been talking, we've been looking at some footage we have of Osama bin Laden, who is the leader of this al-Qaeda uh, group, uh, this widespread, well-funded group that has been linked to terrorist activities for a number of years. Just give us a little bit of context here. How, how has Pakistan been in any way linked to bin Laden? Well, Pakistan has been accused for a long time of, of providing safe haven uh, for uh, Osama bin Laden's group, but not basically on the ground, but across the border, back and forth between Afghanistan, where Osama bin Laden is, and on Pakistani territory, where a lot of his support comes from, maybe some of his financing comes from, uh, some of his volunteers and associates uh, may indeed come from Pakistani soil. So uh, that relationship across the border uh, has been kind of fuzzy over the years, uh, but uh, there has been, you know, s some charges and accusations that the Pakistanis have, have been walking a line on both sides of the border, uh, assisting Osama bin Laden and, and denying it at the same time. So uh, that question is going to be answered in the next few days about, we're with you, what does that really mean? The Pakistani president saying to George Bush in the battle against terrorism, denouncing it, deploring it, uh, and, and saying that uh, we are with you. Uh, I think, uh, you know, U.S. President George Bush is probably waiting to hear what we're with you really means. And uh, that conversation is going to be going on behind closed doors on secure telephone lines back and forth right now between the United States and Pakistan. All right. And we, as we look at pictures of Wendy Chamberlain, the new incoming U.S. ambassador to Pakistan, uh, we await your guidance as to whether this is a background briefing or an on-camera news conference. If it is the latter, we will, of course, bring it to you live as soon as it happens. Thank you, CNN's Tom Mentir, live from Islamabad. And just stay with us on that account. We'll keep you posted on what happens there. Let's uh, turn it back now to the Pentagon. CNN's Bob Franken has been standing uh, outside in the wake of uh, the devastation there. Uh, we've been talking an awful lot about those who are missing. Uh, we haven't talked as much about those who survived. Uh, the carnage of the other day. Uh, Bob is going to tell us a little bit more about that. Bob? Well, Miles, we've been hearing so much about the tragedy of this, but also stories of heroism, and we have two examples of that with me right now. We have a David Thayall, who's standing right next to me, and Carl Monken. Both of you 
We're working in an office maybe about 100 feet or so from where the airplane actually collided. Tell me what happened. Uh, we did indeed. We were indeed working about 100 feet from what I call ground zero. Uh, I was talking to a friend, uh, a major friend of mine in the Army, who was calling up to ask if I'd heard about the uh, World Trade Center. And of course, I did. Everybody in the Pentagon did. The whole Pentagon was abuzz that morning with, uh, with, with the video footage of that. And she jokingly told me, you know, the Pentagon is probably next. You ought to get out of there. And we sort of chuckled about that. And she said again, I'm serious, David. You really ought to get out of there. And it was at that moment that I have described it as the gates of hell opening up. The wall that was beside me just simply crumpled, much the way that you would crumple a piece of loose leaf paper. And you have a moment there to realize what is happening. And probably because she had planted the seed in my mind, I knew instantaneously what was happening. And I, I thought, we're under attack. And there was a brilliant flash of light which came from the, the corners of the wall which had given away. And immediately I was thrown about 25 feet back into the office next door. Still had the phone in my hand. And uh, my response was, was immediate. Again, because she had planted the seed, I'm sure. And I immediately started making my way towards uh, Carl, who was about 25 feet away from me in front uh, in what another was going office. On with you? I was sitting there working on my desk. I just got upstairs, uh, or came down from uh, downstairs uh, watching the, uh, the, the terrible scene of the uh, World Trade Center. I sit down and uh, my PC just uh, just comes and hits me in my face. But it was more than that. It was this instantaneous this force that, uh, in my mind, uh, closed my, uh, my eyes and I can hear the ripping of the metal, the tearing down of the walls, and just this force that knocks me. Uh, I don't know how far back, but when I looked up, I saw nothing but uh, just confusion. Uh, the, the walls were down. We were crawling over uh, the, our studio that, where we work. And we went to the next room. We found some people. Uh, I call him Bird Dog because he was looking for a way out. And he said, Let, Cowboy, let's get out of here. So we did. And we went to the room and said, where are we? I said, we're in D D Delta 535. And I said, OK, let's keep moving. And we knew that where we had to go. And on the way, we heard people that were, were crying or were upset. But it was still not a sense of chaos, even though we were there where there was hardly any light except from the fire and from the emergency lights. When I came to, there was the walls around me were on fire. One of the walls had collapsed on top of me, and I will believe until the day I die that that deflected the fireball, which had injured so many people in offices near us. Well, your offices are on the first floor, right? That is correct. Yeah, and so, of course, some of the and damage was overhead. The fireball, as you found out, literally went over your head. It right? did indeed. I mean, there was obviously a fire source for when I stopped, when I finally landed, everything around me was on fire, and the smoke was just incredible. The smoke was just billowing into our little corridor just an incredible rate and frankly that there is a vacuum that happens on impact and the lungs the air in my lungs were just sucked out and the first breath that I took was just this intensely hot thick smoke burning you were knocked out you were almost knocked out I wasn't knocked out actually I was spring loaded immediately I was up and over the walls and calling for Carl's as I understand it that once you found that you were safe you then tried to get other people out we did and we started climbing over the rubble and it was a matter of there were no floors left I mean it was just rubble on the floor that we were walking on top of twisted dead desks and filing cabinets and portions of walls, uh, so much so that you can, you can lean on the ceiling at certain points. And I was, in fact, grabbing rebar that was hanging out of the ceiling. I was amazed at the destruction. It was total. It was complete, just as far as you could see, just nothing but rubble. And we got scared at one point for when we came up to where I thought that the hallway should have been, there was a cement blockade in our way. And I really got scared at that point because the smoke was so bad that I thought that we were entombed in it. But we were able to pull some cement away and bend some rebar back. And, only upon reflection and hearing other stories that I, I truly believe that it was the floor that fell down and it simply fell down like a garage door and continued to block sections of the hallway. Were people following you? I mean, you yes. have the nickname Bird Dog now. When we had <laughs> crawled through, I was, I, I refused to die. I remember making a conscious decision in there. I am not going to die here in the Pentagon today. And when we got to that first cement blockade, and I, it was just a matter of running my hands along the wall, pulled some cement down, bent the rebar back, and Carl was hot on my tail, and we crawled through that and into another section. And when we crawled into that other section, there was just this eerie white dust on everybody's face. And I think one of the emergency emergency lights had strangely illuminated the entire area. And a few people whose names I don't know, but uh, whose faces I recognize, we pass them every day in the hallway. Everyone just had this look on this face like, did this really just happen? And I buzzed right by them asking if everybody was okay. Carl was checking on other people. And you can hear people calling for other people. You can hear people making an accountability, an immediate accountability there for their people in the area. And we continued our movement on out of the Pentagon. I knew where there was a door and I just continued my movement towards that area. Now, as I understand it, one of the first people who you saw when you got outside 
was uh, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. It was about a minute and a half or so after we had gotten outside because as soon as we got outside and, and we made a run down the E-ring, we were on D-ring, of course, which is one hallway back from E-ring, which is the outside ring, and we, we ran down E-ring calling for people before we'd actually left the Pentagon, but E-ring, thankfully so, was vacated because in preparation for the renovation in the Pentagon, E-ring was, was vacated, and there wasn't much left to it, frankly. And at that moment, we saw some emergency people running into the building, and without respirators, we knew that we had to get out because the smoke was so bad. And as soon as we exited the Pentagon, there were people who had simply collapsed outside and, and gasping for fresh air, and we simply picked them up. And there was just, it was amazing to watch how the military just sort of naturally fell in line. There are certain, right. certain skills that are simply instinctive to you when you, it's drilled into you. As a former soldier, it was, I didn't even have to think about what happened. As a reserve officer, nor did Carl, and there was others yeah, on the spot. Central. As I understand it, the three-star general automatically started, in fact, organizing things out That's there. Correct. We saw a lieutenant colonel out there who was a doctor. She was the first, and I asked her what she needed me to do, and she said, make an IV, and I told her I'm not a medic, and she stretched the IV and said, make it look just like this. They were so, improvising. so as I understand it, at about that moment, you saw the secretary. Yeah, there was a secondary explosion. There was some confusion, some screaming. Somebody yelled out that it's probably a fuel tank. I remember thinking that makes sense, and we went back to work. And uh, it was probably, I would say, 15, 20 minutes or so after the explosion when we were triaging these people. And we had medevaced one lady away who was burned. Uh, and uh, we just sort of made our way for these, as these people came out. They would just be laid further down the line. And there was a point there about 15, 20 seconds where I wasn't engaged. Carl was holding an IV bag and I looked up and there was the Secretary of Defense. And I remember thinking, good for you. This makes sense. And I stood up uh, and just started briefing the Secretary of Defense as to the, the injuries that we had sustained in this area, describing some of the injuries, describing that one lady had been medevaced away and some of the other inju injuries that we saw. So we want to report now that uh, the Dover, Delaware facility, which is designed to handle uh, casualties, that type of thing, we've uh, seen it so many times used when there have been overseas disasters. It has been activated. It will be receiving those who did not make it, but we've just heard the story, the heroic story of uh, somebody who, in fact, was able to survive. Miles? CNN's Bob Franken reporting live from the Pentagon. Uh, to say that was a harrowing tale is a bit of an, uh, an understatement. Uh, let's go back to Islamabad, Pakistan. We had just reported to you a little while ago via Tom Mentir, our person there, Would that uh, awesome. a briefing is about to begin <laughs> with Pakistani officials. Uh, in the wake of the U.S. Ambassador Wendy Chamberlain presenting her papers. Uh, the person we're about to hear from is Major General Rashid Qureshi. He is Pakistan's presidential press secretary. Let's, there he is right there. Let's listen in. No, sir. All right. Do we need the question again? Uh, at present, I don't think there's anything specific that, it, that has been asked. Um, the President, uh, General Parvez Musharraf, did make a statement last evening uh, when he came back from uh, uh, Karachi to, to the capital, and he went into a high-level meeting yesterday, last night, and he did make a statement. Um, if any of you haven't got that statement, we can give that to you. Um, what happened today was that the uh, American ambassador to Pakistan uh, presented her cred credentials to uh, uh, President, and uh, there was an exchange of views there also. And I think after that short exchange of views, the American ambassador uh, did talk to, I think, CNN uh, for a short while. And I think she said what needed to be said. What regard will he allow, for example, U.S. troops on his soil to <coughs> share intelligence? What kind of cooperation will he give? You see, uh, we cannot go into areas that haven't been discussed or defined as yet. So, uh, and I'll read out his last sentence that he said yesterday, and that was that I wish to assure President Bush and the United States government of our, that is Pakistan's, unstinted cooperation in the fight against terrorism. Now, beyond that, uh, we cannot really answer questions 
the knowledge of which we do not have, answers of which we do not have. Uh, no, that, that's not true. No, no Pakistani delegation has visited Kabul yesterday, as was reported. And today also, no. Sir, can you tell us about the nature of discussions that General Mahmoud has had in the United States, especially with American intelligence officials, on which there have been many reports? And also, can you respond to those who say that this is perhaps the most critical time in Pakistan's relations with the United States, because you have to make a choice. Either you go with the United States, which would then mean taking a position against the Taliban and many groups that Pakistan has supported over the years, or decide to stand firmly against the U.S. What's your response to, uh, response to this, to this, this overall question? Uh, the first portion of your question, I have no knowledge of what has been discussed between General Mahmood and uh, uh, people in the United States. Uh, he is not in Pakistan as yet. Um, I guess one will come to know after he returns. Uh, the second part, uh, there needs to be a specific concern or requirement conveyed before a, a decision can be made. Uh, as I said before, there has been no specific demand. As far as your question of uh, uh, support is concerned, Pakistan has always said that the best way to deal with the Afghans is to engage with them. Um, that's been Pakistan's policy, and uh, that's how decisions have been made. In the past, uh, Pakistan has conveyed to the United States and to all other countries that the best way to, to deal with the Afghans or the Afghan government is to continue to engage with them. Uh, beyond that, uh, Pakistan has always said that it does not support terrorism in any form. Pakistan is against it and has cooperated not only with the United States, but with the world on combating terrorism in the past and will continue to do so in the future. Has the United States contacted Pakistan uh, for the extradition of Osama bin Laden? Do you think they do? What is the Pakistan response? I frankly have no knowledge of uh, what you've said. It's a hypothetical question. Several meetings today, certainly, if, if not in Afghanistan, here in Pakistan, between yourself and the Taliban. Um, could you give us some indication of what was discussed? I don't think there was any meeting today between uh, uh, Pakistan government officials and the Afghans. Apparently, there was a foreign ministry. In the foreign ministry? Yes. Then I'm not aware of that. The a high level meeting last night, prepared over by all that had to be given was given out by the president. Uh, beyond that, uh, I don't think. Yes. Now, have Pakistan intelligence service picked up um, any intelligence that they've been able to convey to the United States on uh, any groups or individuals in this region that may have been involved in these terrorist attacks? Uh, frankly, I do not know. I, I don't think uh, that there has been any uh, any intelligence that Pakistan intelligence uh, sources have picked up. If you heard reports that the Taliban have uh, detained Osama bin Laden today under house arrest, and do you give any credence at all to those reports? I read a report um, in the Times of India on the Times of India website. Uh, referring to what you have said, this was Dateline Dubai, and at the bottom was a very thin line saying that it has been denied by the Taliban. So uh, I really don't know. We have no information about it. However, there was a report uh, which I saw on the BBC very recently, just about, I think, about an hour, an hour and a half back. They have lifted from the, I suppose, from the same yeah. source. Uh, General, when um, President Clinton visited here, he invited Pakistani government to face 
the choice, as he put it, between going with the West, going with globalization, going with the developing economies of the world, and choosing another <coughs> bleaker path. Is there a sense in your government that the moment has arrived at which you're going to have to make that choice? What makes you think that we are or have been or would be on the bleaker path? We are on the path where the entire humanity is. We are on the path where the world would like to be. We are on the path where right is. We are on the path where justice is. We are with the rest of the civilization of this world. This is what the president has said, that we join the world community in condemning in the strongest possible words whatever has happened two days ago in the United States. We are, com we are with the world in combating terrorism. So how, where is the question of uh, being on, on any other path? Most are certainly you, not. Are you therefore prepared to make potentially very hard choices involving the change of your government's policy towards Afghanistan, towards the Taliban, and towards Islamic extremist movements in general? Let me repeat, there is no need for us to change because we are already on the, pi on the path of justice, on the path of righteousness. We are with the world against terrorism. I mean, I don't understand why, what, what the question is. I mean, how can we, how can we be against, uh, against the current? I mean, we are with the world on this. The Why question, do you, what makes you believe that we are on any other path? The question is, sir, whether Pakistan is actually prepared to match those words with action. I mean, the reality is that this is the closest ally to the Taliban, a regime which most of the world regards to be a sponsor of terrorism, and which is the focus of investigations over the last 48 hours. We will, we, we, see, we have to, you see, you, you, you are asking us to answer, a hypo, uh, respond to a hypothetical situation. The general just said a little while ago that there has been no specific uh, demand from any quarter. So the, why, sh uh, why should we react or uh, respond to something that is yet to happen? I mean, general, in, in future, uh, in the past, I think uh, there's a misperception here that uh, Pakistan uh, in some way has hesitated in cooperating uh, with the world, as you put it. I don't think that is true. Uh, Pakistan has continuously said that the way to resolve crises are or is to, to engage with people, not to drive them into a corner. Uh, that's been Pakistan's policy. Nowhere has Pakistan ever prevented, you know, culprits from being brought to justice. I think the amount of cooperation that Pakistan has had with the United States, as well as other countries, in combating terrorism, um, I think very few countries uh, can match that. So this perception that uh, for some reason uh, Pakistan's been uh, out of line is incorrect. A pair of Pakistani officials, the Presidential Press Secretary, General Rashid Qureshi, and Anwar Manood, who is the Secretary of the Ministry of Information, offering defensive replies to reporters uh, asking questions about Pakistan's links to the Taliban in Afghanistan and, uh, by inference, to Osama bin Laden, uh, the person who is at the top of the suspect list in the wake of these brutal attacks on the United States. Let's turn it now to Afghanistan, to Kabul, where CNN's Nick Robertson has been standing by. I believe he was able to listen to a little bit of this uh, uh, news conference. Uh, Nick, I don't want to bury the lead here. They did deny some earlier reports. CNN has not been carrying them, but since they were stated on our air, we'll just underscore the point, denied reports that Osama bin Laden uh, was being held in custody by the Taliban. I'm just curious, uh, your thoughts on what you just heard, at least a portion of it, and just a general sense of the mood there in Kabul. 
Well, if we deal first with the issue of Osama bin Laden's detention, certainly the uh, early indications today from the Taliban were that he was not under detention. Um, because this has become a more central issue through the day, we've pursued Taliban sources this afternoon, and we expect to hear back from several sources in a few hours' time uh, exactly what the situation is. Currently, from the spokesman's office of the spiritual leader of the Taliban, Mullah Omar, and as well from, the, from a spokesman within the foreign ministry here in Kabul, but at the moment, they will neither confirm nor deny the story that uh, Osama bin Laden is under Taliban detention. However, the current thinking uh, uh, for analysts here listening to the earlier reports is that it would be unlikely. Um, the Taliban have often said in the past that it would, they would be far more likely to expel Osama bin Laden than arrest him. But at this stage, uh, we are waiting to hear back from two key sources within the Taliban about whether or not Osama bin Laden is under house arrest. Now, in 1998, shortly after the attack on the, uh, on the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, the Taliban put Osama bin Laden, as they put it, incommunicado. They said that they were preventing him from communicating with the outside world, and they prevented him uh, from talking with journalists. Now, he was, in fact, at various times able to contact members of his family elsewhere in the world. At that time, that indicated a degree of control that the Taliban said they were putting on Osama bin Laden. But it is very, very difficult here at this time with very poor communication and a very uh, secretive uh, situation to find out more definitively about Osama bin Laden. Nobody here uh, knows where he lives or is willing to say where he lives. Uh, his whereabouts, uh, we've been told before, often change. He often moves at night. So very, very difficult to get hard confirmation on stories like this. The story came out of the United Arab Emirates, uh, not from here in Afghanistan. So again, further checking needs to be done. As for the mood here in Afghanistan, a lot of apprehension in the city. People concerned about what could be coming next. Uh, three United Nations flights today took off taking out the last remaining United Nations personnel in the city. Most of the non-governmental charity aid groups working here, their international workers have left. And the majority of the workers, international workers from the International Committee from the Red Cross have left as well. And that's leaving a lot of people here wondering exactly what's going to happen next. For them, that's a bad omen when they see the international workers here packing up and leaving miles. Nick, uh, when you talk about these omens and the, uh, the rising crescendo of talk about retaliation uh, on the part of the U.S. or perhaps some sort of NATO response even, uh, at what point does Osama bin Laden become uh, just too much of a liability for the Taliban? Uh, and I'm cognizant of the fact there is no extradition treaty with the U.S. Uh, if that were the case, where might he be sent? Well, between Afghanistan and Pakistan, there are extradition understandings. Uh, Pakistan has told the Taliban before of various individuals uh, they want for crimes committed in Pakistan who they believe are in hiding in Afghanistan. And some of those individuals have been handed over to Pakistan before. Is that likely in the case of Osama bin Laden? The root and the ties that bond the Taliban to Osama bin Laden are very, very strong, and one should not underestimate them. And they go back to Osama bin Laden's role here in Afghanistan during the Soviet occupation in the 1980s. He played a key role in helping organize, in helping finance uh, uh, not only the military machine, but also the, uh, the logistics support of the Mujahideen fighters that were at the time being supported by the United States as well to help drive out the uh, Soviet occupation that finally ended in 1989. So Osama bin Laden is owed a debt of gratitude in the Taliban eyes by Afghanistan. So when he sought sanctuary here in 1996, the Taliban felt obliged to give it to him. And many of his spiritual ideas would be in keeping and along the lines of the ideas of the Taliban. There are a lot of issues to bind them together. Afghan hospitality is is extremely generous, almost to a fault, 
uh, willing to befriend uh, people that they would see in trouble. The Afghans are a very friendly people, and indeed the Taliban culture, they are ethnic Pashtuns, they come from the southeast of Afghanistan, close to Pakistan, and it is a very friendly and warm, uh, generous uh, tribal spirit that they have that, that, op that puts out of a, ha a hand of friendship to people they see in need. So uh, in those terms, there's a very strong tie between them, unlikely it would seem at this stage, perhaps to, to be moving towards handing them over. CNN's Nick Robertson offering us uh, some excellent insights and context from Kabul, Afghanistan. Thank you very much uh, for being with us. And we will, of course, stay in close contact with him as events progress. Let's uh, send it back to New York City and Paul Lazan. Thanks so much, Miles. As you know, many Americans now are sort of uh, either in this, uh, well, their, their state of shock or their state of numbness is turning into a state of anger, wondering how this could have happened in, in this country of ours. And we're going to turn now to William Webster, who is not only the former head, the head of the FBI, but the CIA as well. Good to see you again, sir. Thank you very much Thank for joining you, us this morning. Mr. Webster, uh, you don't now uh, are probably sensing some of the anger of Americans. Did the U.S. government let Americans down? That's a question that I think will have to wait uh, a more reasoned time of judgment. What we're seeing right now is understandable. We see it in our own home lives. Uh, when things go wrong, there's denial, there's anger, there's a range of things. What I want to see and what I clearly think we are seeing is resolve. Resolve to take care of the victims. Resolve to find out who was responsible. Resolve to run that. You see the fast-breaking news all over the country and indeed around the world. Resolve, once we have clearly identified them, to have an appropriate response for a great nation uh, determined to protect our freedoms and freedom around the world. So let's not make those, try to make those judgments. The cellular nature of terrorism makes it the most difficult to truly identify plans. We've interdicted countless numbers of terrorist incidents, including uh, Saddam Hussein's terrorist teams out uh, during the Gulf War. Uh, what happened here remains uh, how, why they were able to uh, keep all of this uh, from somehow breaking loose is a, is, a, is a question that deserves to be answered, and it will be answered in time. Yeah, I think Americans are trying to uh, uh, appreciate just how well orchestrated this campaign was, how well financed it must have been. But it would appear as though law enforcement agents or agencies have been able to get a lot of information uh, and actually driving to the point where they know the identities of, of some of the terrorists involved in these attacks. Does that mean that our intelligence, that U.S. intelligence, perhaps with intelligence provided by some friendly countries, uh, should have been able to uncover these attacks before they happened? Paula, that's a judgment that I think we need to wait. I'm very proud to see the fast movement, uh, the picking up of little leads, even the cell phone conversations on airplanes that tragically went down, uh, tracking them down, very much like the uh, speed with which the perpetrators of the Oklahoma bombing were identified from small fragments of evidence by skilled professionals who know what to do with them. In, in uh, terms of anticipating this kind of event, there were lots of warnings that, that we were vulnerable to terrorist attacks uh, on, uh, in the air uh, and bombings. Uh, you know the whole debate about protecting the White House on Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, the specifics depend. If we have as many people as appear to be involved in this, one may reasonably say, why didn't somebody break loose and start to talk? Apparently, some are starting to talk now. But in a cellular activity, often the people who have the, the responsibility, as in the planes, don't know their full assignment, don't know when it's going to happen, and are carefully sworn to secret. It's a tough business, but let's, we'll make that judgment after we've done our duty to bring them to justice. Uh, Mr. Webster, one last question for you. Intelligence officials have intercepted calls after Tuesday's attacks on the United States from members of a terrorist ring called Akeda, which is supported by Osama bin Laden. Excuse me. How I've been talking a long time this morning. I lost my voice. But uh, how much is actually known about this group? Uh, I can't answer that question, and I don't think now would be the time to be uh, outlining uh, the... the uh, information that is close held. Uh, it's clear that the, the government is acting on every bit of available information. No uh, 
lead is considered frivolous. Thousands of them are being run down. This particular group, there are others, uh, often called by different names. Often names change. Uh, I'd li I wish I had an answer for you, but I don't. But we will have an answer, and we will have one soon. And in fact, uh, I think that uh, the Secretary of State indicated uh, yesterday that uh, if and when they have those answers, uh, that this won't be a campaign that will be over quickly to deal with uh, either the perpetrators of this or those uh, countries or, or groups that uh, have harbored these. Uh, Mr. Webster, William Webster, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate your perspective this thank morning. Thank you, Paul. I need to tell you that here in New York City, as you can see from this shot, uh, the smoke plume continues to hang over the city. The EPA telling us now they have tested for levels of, of various uh, dangerous uh, particles in the air. They do not exist. Uh, nevertheless, a lot of folks working in that uh, horrible uh, destruction area are walking around uh, with mass among them. Michael Aku, who has gotten very close to where these rescue operations are underway, and uh, he is wearing this mask for good reason. Describe to us what you've seen this morning. Well, Paula, I'm, of course, I'm wearing, wearing this mask because I'm just a few blocks north of uh, Ground Zero, what, of course, used to be the twil Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. And we're essentially standing right underneath this uh, recognizable, what's become a very recognizable plume of smoke that's come to symbolize the aftermath of this disaster. Um, it smells almost as if you're standing in the middle of, a, of the burning embers of a bonfire. And what caused this bonfire? What are the effects of this bonfire? You can see it throughout the streets of lower Manhattan this morning. Cars like this, which were essentially pulled out of, of ground zero away from the site. Um, you can see just uh, behind this car, uh, the, the words inscripted, somebody Captain. wrote in the word, uh, the words, God bless. Um, obviously for inspiration for those who survived and uh, for many of the families who, um, who also uh, lost some loved ones. And yet at the same time, somebody wrote just here in the front window, the words war. And you can understand why people's uh, emotions run so high when, you, when, you, when you're down here. This car covered in, 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 in debris is absolutely pales in comparison to what's just north of it. These two stacked cars were pulled from ground zero, from someplace very near the World Trade Center, by rescue workers, by crews, um, to make it easier for them to do their job, to get to, to what they hope might be some surviving life, and to find whatever else they might be able to find there. But you can see just the, the devastation and the force of this blast by looking at these two cars. You can see here the front of the car, what used to be an engine. And if you look down at this tire, these were obviously still be belted tires. This is what remains of them, just rods. In the back of this car, I want to show you this because this is what struck me as well. For some odd reason, I, I looked at the back of this car and I thought, my goodness, you know, somebody was getting married. Then I realized, of course not. These are actually ribbons of steel shards of, uh, of uh, somebody's uh, previous possession. And what happened to the person who owned this car, we can only speculate, you know, we don't know. And just north of here, another car. I'm gonna put my mask on from time to time. Just over here, another car. Um, again, blasted, completely gutted. You might be able to see inside what was once somebody's comfortable vehicle completely looks like it was at the center of a war zone. And in, and in fact, in many ways, it is the center of a war zone. And just across the street, William, if you can pan over to the left here, just across the street, you can see a Con Ed van, or what used to be a Con Ed van. Now, Con Anderson is the, uh, the local utility company that services a great part of New York and New York State. And the people who work for Con Anderson often respond to emergencies just like this one. You can only imagine what might have happened to the people who were in that car. Now, we don't know whether anyone was in that car. That car may very well have been here before the emergency, uh, before the disaster occurred. Um, but when you look at vehicles like this one that, that, uh, that belong to people who respond to emergencies like this, you can only think of the firefighters and the police officers who responded to this scene. Mayor Giuliani has already said 
that uh, there are 350, maybe more than 350 firefighters and police who have been unaccounted for. What happened to their vehicles? Did they arrive here moments after the scene hoping to help people and were caught in the blast or, or caught when the, the rubble came down? You can only speculate. Paula? Michael, I think we'd all feel a lot more comfortable if you'd leave that mask on. I, I, you know, we're two miles north of, of there, and even and we are beginning to, to feel the sting of, of this smoke. Once again, you are only how many blocks from, from where the trade centers went down? I'm, very, I'm about less than about eight blocks from where the World Trade Center went down, and you can see I'm on a very busy, busy street. They're using this as sort of an artery to go back and forth, uh, supplying uh, equipment. Uh, firefighters obviously still responding to the scene and to, to other scenes around the World Trade Center. Just moments ago, William, I'm going to ask you to pan back over again. Just moments ago, we saw this truck with uh, what looks like a lot of plywood and other kinds of materials on the back of it. Um, and I am told that they could be using this wood for a variety of reasons. They might be using it to support some of the buildings, some of the existing uh, areas where they're trying to work to give themselves a little bit more support. Um, and on a more sort of ghastly side, and, and yet the grim reality of what, what we are facing here, they might be using some of this wood to essentially build boxes uh, because they've, uh, they've run out of some stretchers in some areas. So some of this material might be used to actually build what they call litter boxes for some of the bodies that they will remove from the rubble. Paula. I'll tell you one thing, Michael, I can only gauge reaction based on how my crew is reacting to these pictures. Uh, they are absolutely sickening, and I think you are the first person who has given us an idea of just how tremendous uh, the impact was. I mean, you have shown us the car with how someone wrote war on the windshield, how someone wrote God bless. Um, on, a, on a purely human level, what are you thinking as you're looking at this stuff? You can't help but look at this, and the first thing you think of is, I'm in the middle of a war zone. And that's an adjustment, of course, as we've mentioned before, that many of New Yorkers have had to make. We feel very much like we're in the middle of a war zone. The second thing that you have to think about is the fact that there were people there. Um, oftentimes, you look at these pictures and you think, my goodness, we've lost the World Trade Center. Well, we lost a lot of lives in that World Trade Center as well. And when you look at the cars and you look at just, just how severe the damage was, one can only imagine what must it have been like to be there. And then thirdly, I think, what must it have been like to be there? Well, how miraculous it is that they actually found some people alive. Sometimes God is smiling on you. All right, Michael, we're going to leave it there and come back to you uh, later on in the day. Put that mask back on. You need it down there. The EPA is telling, it, uh, telling us we don't need it up here. Once again, uh, for the first time, many New Yorkers are actually smelling the sting of this smoke because uh, the uh, winds have changed a little bit. And I know last night uh, from standing up here, it's, it's a little bit better today. Uh, but uh, it, it uh, is a stinging, acrid uh, kind of smell. Uh, let's go back to Atlanta now where Miles continues to stand by. Okay, Paula, thank you. We could talk all day and not rival those pictures for telling the story of what has unfolded this week. Let's move now to another borough of uh, New York City, Staten Island, where CNN's Hillary Lane is standing by, unable, at least at last uh, conversation with her, unable to get onto Staten Island uh, because authorities there had cordoned off the area. Hillary, give us an update. Well, Miles, I'm actually on the New Jersey side where we were turned away from crossing one of the bridges under Staten Island. The reason for that was that New York, New Jersey Port Authority police had been tracking a vehicle that was suspected of some involvement in the World Trade Center attack, tracking that vehicle on Staten Island, which is one of the five boroughs of New York City and Island, just like Manhattan. They did locate the car when they found the car. They found that their lead had been unfounded. And what Port Authority people are saying this morning they know it was an inconvenience to commuters there was a backup of at least an hour on these different crossings but they said at a time like this and at any time they would not compromise the safety of anybody in the region miles that is what is going on staten island is being reopened what is turning out to have been a false lead back to you all right hillary i'm sorry i didn't hear the last part staten island is in fact open for business now so to speak 
that, that is exactly it. They are reopening Staten Island. They're saying following up on any lead that they can at this point. That is the reason that they shut down the island for about half an hour this morning. But cars are now able to move both onto the island and off of the island to get back to business. CNN's Hillary Lane, who is now on Staten Island or fast approaching Staten Island. Paula. Miles, I know you mentioned a little bit earlier on uh, that we are awaiting a news conference that is going to be held by the U.S. Department of Transportation. If and uh, when that happens, we will go to it live. In the meantime, we are now joined by Mary Schiavo, who is the former Department of Transportation Inspector General. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this Thank morning. You. Thank you. I wanted to get uh, your quick reaction to some of the new guidelines that are going to go uh, into effect at air airports across the nation. I am going to quickly recap some of these new regulations. Among them, no curbside check-in. Only ticketed passengers will be allowed through security. No knives of any kind can be brought on board and higher standards for security personnel and more federal marshals in place at larger airports. Will any of this prevent the kind of attack that uh, the United States has just endured? No, this is a piecemeal response, and I think it really gives away uh, how shell-shocked the FAA is. Many of these recommendations, for example, the tighter and, and higher standards for security personnel, those have been recommendations for almost a decade, and now we're seeing them in the wake of this uh, terrible terrorist attack on domestic aviation. We have had sky marshals, by the way. We have very few numbers, uh, but increasing that is definitely an improvement. But what we need is we need coordinated law enforcement to run our aviation security at our nationwide airports in a coordinated manner, not a civilian FAA uh, piecing it together with, uh, you know, local authorities across the country. And this has pointed up that great shortcoming. All right. Well, what do you mean by that? That, that you'd have law enforcement agents stationed at every security zone in, a, in an airport? They would be the ones overseeing the, the checking in of luggage and, and uh, the handling of hand baggage as you, you head to your airport gate? Uh, no, actually, it's more pervasive than that. It, it stems at the, uh, from the very top. Right now, our overall coordination of airport security and our policies and procedures are set by the Civilian Federal Aviation Administration, which has been highly criticized for well over a decade at being unable to perform this function. The law enforcement function overall, setting the policies, running the programs, telling our airports, our almost 400 uh, passenger service airports, how to do this in other countries is run by law enforcement but not by the civilian FAA. And also we see this, this incredible uh, patchwork quilt of security. We see, uh, even now, we see the Federal Aviation Administration telling the airports one by one to handle various situations. We see local authorities. Uh, we see uh, local uh, um, uh, security and uh, police forces. And what we need is a national coordinated federal law enforcement oversight of airports because we are only as safe as our weak, weakest link. If Boston Logan is is weak and you can board a plane at Boston Logan and go compromise Chicago or Columbus, then the entire system points out the fallacy of having it on an airport by airport basis. I understand what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. But if you are to believe the reports that have been in the Boston Globe newspaper and the Boston Herald newspaper, or all, you know, most of those reporters recognizing that there have been some security lapses at Logan Airport, the bottom line is, from, from what we're hearing from sources, that some of the men who hijacked these airliners from, from Boston actually, um, the stuff that they carried on them never would have picked up the security to begin with. They apparently carried razors that were embedded in, in plastic knives. I mean, how would the law enforcement uh, uh, impact have changed this? Well, for one, we have we had a spotty policy. It's astonishing that our debate in the wake of this, a part of our debate in the wake of this tragedy, is debating what kind of knives were acceptable. And we had screeners uh, unprepared and untrained, um, you know, literally given the message that some knives are okay and some aren't. And it, it's a four-inch blade. Uh, are these four inches? Are they not? Do they have ceramic handles? The other problem is, of course, that we now know that at least at one airport they had ramp 
uh, access, uh, which is not surprising with, an, with a coordinated attack this big and it, for as easy it is to get a job at an airport. I mean, many of the jobs are minimum wage, low or no screening. We have had convictions for actually lying about uh, security agencies or uh, companies actually doing the background checks. Now, that has even been the subject of a criminal case in this country. Um, so now we know that the system is compromised from within as well. And this is a total failure of the system saying, oh, well, okay, uh, some screeners missed it uh, or some screeners, uh, you know, weren't even required to pick it up. We have something far more serious going on than that when we find out that they have ramp passes and, and literally could have compromised the entire system. But once again, even if you had had this plan in effect that you're suggesting with law enforcement basically running aviation across the country from, from top to bottom, the fact remains that if it, given uh, how martyrdom in some parts of the country, or excuse me, in some parts of the world are, are honored and, and promoted, if you want to slam a, get onto a plane, um, you're going to find a way out of the plane and, and is there anyone that can stop you from slamming it into a building? Absolutely, and we have to stop it. See, that's the whole that's the whole point. I think it's it's the fear that we can't stop them. Of course we can. And remember, this is we're not talking one, we're talking four. And if we are unable uh, through a minimum wage employees to stop four uh, airplanes being used as a bomb because we say, well, we can't pick it up on a metal detector, then the answer is is actually astonishingly simple. Then don't do it that way. If we do not have the ability to screen this out, you know, I, I was struck by the fact that that people are gas that they might not be able to carry on the, the you know, the dozens of carry-on bags. You know, if you go into certain department stores, I forget which one it is in New York, the employees come in with little uh, uh, clear plastic bags. I mean, we're willing to subject employees at department stores to protect the, you know, the designer shoes and the employees come in in clear plastic okay. bags. There are ways around this and we have to Marie. admit that. Uh, Mary, I'm sorry to have to cut you off. Uh, we really appreciate the information you've given us today, but we got to cut in and go to a news conference that the mayor of the city of New York is holding right now. Let's drop in there. Thanks for your time. That's right. Let's go right now to that press conference. Uh, New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani speaking now. ...that we're following. That is, uh, when the medical examiner is able to identify the remains as a body, then they'll be identified, they'll be numbered basically for identification. We have 94 of those, 94 where we have bodies for identification. 46 of those 94 have actually been identified. And uh, then we have the gruesome and horrible situation that in many cases we recover only parts of bodies, and we have 70 uh, 70 category. So there's 94 bodies, 74, uh, 70 body parts. And uh, I'm sorry that I have to describe it that way, but that's unfortunately the situation that we're facing. We have, uh, we have 4,763 uh, people on the missing persons list. That's a list that's uh, as inclusive as we can make it. It includes uh, the plane itself, the manifest. It includes uh, people that have been I identified to us by family members. It includes uh, the information we've been able to glean from businesses who are looking for people that uh, they believed were working and they haven't been able to make contact with. Uh, but that's the list that we're working with right now. Uh, it could turn out that we recover fewer than that. It could could be more. We don't know the answer to that yet. Um, we have uh, set up now a permanent family center uh, at the Armory on Lexington Avenue and 26th Street. It oper began operating at 8 a.m. Uh, this morning and it will uh, continue to operate until midnight tonight and then it will operate every single day. Yesterday we registered over 2,000 uh, families and uh, therefore if you, if you are looking for someone that you believe is missing as a result of the, uh, of the attack on the World Trade Center, that's the place to come to, to register, to bring identifying uh, data, and we'll do everything we can to, we'll do everything we can to help you. Um, the city uh, is still closed, 14th Street South. Our objective today 
is to try to get it open, a good deal of it open, for uh, midnight tonight, literally, really for tomorrow morning. And uh, we will be working to open it uh, down to Canal Street, and then to open also uh, other selected areas so we can create uh, corridors into the Wall Street area. We'll continue to keep West Street closed uh, all the way down. We'll continue to keep probably a street parallel to West Street closed, and possibly the FDR Drive. We're not sure yet. But tomorrow, the city will be open, certainly down to Canal Street, and then selected portions uh, further down. And uh, obviously, a lot of the work today will be designed to try to get that done by midnight tonight. Um, there are a number of other things, but I'm sure it'll come up in the questions. Uh, again, I want to thank very much the governor and the, and the state and the federal government. Uh, we finished our meeting uh, this morning and were able to coordinate many, many things that would be impossible. Uh, we have been listening to uh, New York Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, who has been giving us some updated numbers right now, on, which show the situation that the recovery workers they are now facing. He says that they are working now with a list of 4,763 missing persons. That number includes the people who are on the planes, people who are in businesses, and other family members who have been calling in looking for folks who they believe were in that area. They have recovered 94 bodies, and they have them identified, right, or numbered, uh, numbered to be identified. 94 bodies numbered. 46 of them have already been identified. And they now have, these, as he says, 70 different body parts that they are working for. Those are grim figures, to be sure. And we will keep an eye on an ear open for the new information on that as it does come out. But for now, let us go to London. And CNN's Christian Amanpour, who's standing by now for more live coverage. Christian. Well, Leon, good afternoon from London. As you know, the United States has been trying to marshal its allies, both political and potentially military support, in dealing with what happened in the United States on Tuesday. The uh, allies have been calling this an attack not just on the United States, but also on the whole of the civilized and democratic world. Joining us now from Paris is the French President Jacques Chirac, who is giving his first interview on this matter. Mr. President, thank you for joining us from France. Can you say now to the American people, to the American president, that you and that France stands four square, fully committed behind what the U.S. plans to do and what the U.S. is going through right now? The people of France have been véritablement traumatized by these events. Infinie tristesse, une immense émotion. La violence, les images d'abord, ces photos d'hommes, de femmes, d'enfants euh, cherchant un être Trying cher to find disparu, et they loved, who disappeared, and showing us their despair and their fear. All of that has touched the French people profoundly. And in fact, there was just a poll that was made in France, and it showed that 96% of the French people are totally show total solidarity for the French people and the for the American people and the American authorities. I have never ever remembered such a unanim unanimity as far as solidarity was concerned. And also, everybody is asking themselves why? How can one answer this question? This kind of madness, this absurdity, this cruelty. And there's no way that one can justify this kind of behavior. And of course, the French people, yes, the French people show total solidarity for the, for the American people. Mr. President, the United States is trying to build a coalition of allies and of other nations to take sides and act and stand up and be counted on this side of this battle, as they call it. NATO yesterday, for the first time in its history, invoked uh, a clause in its treaty that says an attack on one nation is an attack on all nations. What, in your mind, does that mean for France as it ponders uh, supporting the United States uh, in its response to this? What will France do first of all the Americans are not trying to I mean they have certainly obtained unanimity around them in this struggle against terrorism and it's particularly true 
with regard to NATO. And, in fact, that was demonstrated last night at the meeting that uh, took place, uh, the NATO meeting that took place last night. And, in fact, I had already talked about it with President Bush, who'd called me one or two hours beforehand, and I, of course, confirmed that we also would show solidarity with regard to the introduction of Article 5 in the North Atlantic Treaty. And, of course, that means that France certainly will show solidarity to the Americans. And, of course, all NATO countries have done so, and I imagine almost all countries throughout the world. Mr. President, can I uh, press you on that? You were part, France was part of the Gulf War Coalition, uh, France was part of the Balkan Coalition. If the United States decides that it has intelligence that leads it to take military action, will France contribute to that military action in any way? France, I'd like to repeat, will be totally supportive. We will show our solidarity. Of course, we'll have to examine the situation. We'll have to see who's culpable. And after all, in the United States, a great effort is being made, and I think, in fact, it's being done very efficiently. You're trying to search, you're trying to look at all the various indices, and trying to determine precisely, specifically, who is at the origin of this uh, murdering folly. And once we found, then, of course, France will stand with the United States. The United States president has described this as uh, an attack, basically a battle between good and evil, and that the United States will win this battle and the good will eventually triumph. Do you see it in those terms? I have no doubt for a single moment that terrorism which is always based on fanaticism, blindness and madness, terrorism certainly does represent in today's world evil. And, of course, we must win over it with the greatest of energy. Do you see this, Mr. President, as a clash of civilizations, of not just an attack on the United States or on democracies, but something even more profound? I won't talk about uh, shock to civilization, because after all, it would mean that a certain type of civilization could uh, adopt terrorism as a means, as a normal and natural means of expression, as a kind of culture. I don't want to envisage that anyone, that any human being organized within a civilization could adopt such a stance. And so therefore, I believe that terrorism really represents the action of uh, results of certain civilizations. And so therefore, I believe that it's got to be considered as being an aberration, an aberration that's got to be removed from worldwide civilization, which of course has to respect human rights. Uh, you and other uh, world leaders, including, of course, the United States, have described what happened here as, as a monumental atrocity. But, of course, many people in some parts of the world have said that this is an attack on elements of U.S. foreign policy. It's no secret that France has sometimes been at odds uh, with the U.S. over aspects of foreign policy. Will that cause any obstacles to you and to France as you consider joining a coalition and taking any measures that, uh, that the United States and allies deem necessary? Well, one doesn't necessarily have to be always in agreement on everything, because after all, that's a typical characteristic within uh, all families, and we're talking about international family as all families. However, on the other hand, there's one area where there can be no difference of opinion, where there can be no divergence, and that is the need to fight against this perverse illness, this vice, which is terrorism, represented in terrorism. And of course, in that 
that area, there's absolutely no divergence, no difference with regard to the attitude of France, with regard to the attitude of all civilized countries, whatever their religious, their economic, their philosophical backgrounds and United States. Mr. President, one final and question. And in fact, I also Do you think that almost all... May I just ask one last question? Do you believe that yes, uh, military response will be necessary, that this act of terrorism has forced the hand of not only the United States, but the rest of uh, the allies and democracies who have said that they must stand united against this? The United States was targeted, has been targeted, and the United States has been the first victim of this phenomenon in which the whole world, in fact, is involved. But the United States is the first victim, and so it's for the United States, and it's what the United States is doing to determine from whence comes this attack. And then, when that has been done, then the necessary things will have to be done to try to eradicate this evil. And of course, France will certainly be at its side. The means that will be deployed by the Americans, well, it's not for me to prejudge that. It's up to the United States to decide that. But what I can say to you is that as far as eradicating terrorism, as far as fighting against terrorism, France, as I am sure most uh, countries throughout the world, we will only show solidarity to the Americans. President Jacques Chirac of France, thank you very much for joining us on CNN today. All right, thank you very much. Christian Island Poor with that live interview with French President Jacques Chirac. Now, before we went into that uh, interview, we kind of cut short some of the information that we were relaying to you that we were, had called from um, New York Mayor Rudolph Giuliani's uh, press conference. He was announcing some of the latest information that they've been able to, to pull together about uh, the, the grim and, and, in some cases, really gut wrenching task of recovering bodies uh, from the rubble down there in lower Manhattan. And here is the latest information that we have from the mayor. There are 4,763 on the missing persons list at this particular time. Now that number includes the people who were on the planes as well as any people that may have been working in businesses down there as well as people that they have, who have called in, uh, families who have called in to notify authorities that they have people from their families they believe may be down in lower Manhattan. Now to this point, to this point, uh, rescue workers have recovered 94 bodies that they have numbered for identification. 94 bodies have been recovered and of those 94, 46 of them have been identified. That means that they have now left at this particular point, the mayor says, 70 body parts in addition to the remaining uh, bodies that have got to be identified. They've got 70 body parts to deal with. Now, the mayor also went on a note that a, the Omni Hotel at Washington Avenue has been set up as a family service center and it's so far, they've got some 2,000 families registered there. Now, if you think that you need to be among those families who are registered there, if you're trying to find the, out about the whereabouts of loved ones you have not heard from for the past 48 hours, you need to go to the Omni Hotel on Washington Avenue and register there. Now, as far as the city streets and the areas and the businesses down in, the, in Manhattan and maybe near that area, we understand that right now the mayor says everything is open down to Canal Street and that parts of lower Manhattan who have been, that have been closed for the past 48 hours may be opening perhaps as early as midnight tonight or tomorrow morning. And, of course, we'll update you on any more information we get regarding all of that. That we yeah, will. And, uh, Leon, of course, New York City is ground central for the rescue operations, but this is affecting the entire country. And if you stay with us, folks, here on CNN, we're going to keep you up to date on all all that, including your travel plans. First of all, I want to tell you about the Pentagon. The Pentagon is returning to full operations today. It's two days after that hijacked plane slammed into the nation's military center. Almost all 24,000 employees are expected back on the job today at the Pentagon. Half the building is still closed because of smoke and structural damage. Workers are doubling up in offices, and there, too, there is a grim task of searching for victims. That goes on there. The investigation into the attacks is unfolding on several fronts, including flight schools in Florida. Investigators are looking at the records of some students that were trained at the flight schools. They may have been involved in the hijackings. One of them is the same man who rented a car that's been impounded at Boston's Logan Airport. Sources say that 
car contained materials helpful in the investigation, including flight manuals that were written in Arabic. And as you know, of course, the two planes that slammed into the World Trade Center were hijacked from Logan Airport. Now, speaking of airports, we are expecting an announcement any moment now from Transportation Secretary Norman Mineta on air travel. The Department of Transportation says that U.S. airspace will be reopened in the next hour. Earlier today, all three New York area airports reopened on a limited basis. That's according to a New York Port Authority spokesman. He, though, gave no indication of how many flights would be allowed in and out of New York. Airports and airlines are working with the FAA, FAA to make sure that new security procedures are in place, which is a good reminder, Leon, you know, people are stuck across the country right. looking forward to getting home. But even when the airports open and the airlines resume service, it's just not going to be like yeah, it used to be. It's going to take some time to get where you're going. That's right, but it'll still be the first big step towards getting things back to normal right, it's across the country. The step back toward that. All right, let's step back now to New York and Paula who's standing by. Paula? Hi, Darren. Hi, Leon. Leon, I was struck by the numbers you just shared with us coming out of that Mayor Giuliana news conference. I think what is striking about the numbers that you mentioned, particularly the missing persons numbers, is how much they have changed in just a uh, two and a half hour period of time. You mentioned that so far, 4,763 people are considered missing. That is up over a thousand from what the mayor had reported earlier this morning. Now, we have some new information in from the fire commissioner of New York City. He is commenting on reports that there has been some contact from the rubble from a New York City fire department uh, a fireman. And uh, he can't confirm the exact nature of that contact. They are still treating uh, this particular case as a rescue, not a recovery. There is still hope more bodies will be found uh, or more uh, people will be pulled out of the wreckage alive. You might remember yesterday, it seems like a complete p miracle that 11 people were pulled from this wreckage. Uh, six firefighters, three police officers, two civilians. Right now I'm going to check in with Michael LeCou, who uh, just about a half hour ago gave us a stunning, stunning view of just how devastating this attack was in New York. Now, Michael, before you go any further, you, you need to establish for us when you show us pictures of these cars, if these cars were parked uh, blocks away from from uh, what was once the World Trade Center complex or if they've actually been pulled out from the wreckage. Paul, I didn't quite think I understood all of your question, but yes, these cars were pulled from very close to ground zero. Um, and if you look at the image that we've first given you, it, it certainly looks like the images of a war zone. And in fact, uh, that's what it must have been. Uh, indeed, what you are looking at is a car that was pulled out from somewhere close to what were the, uh, what was the World Trade Center, someplace very close to the Twin Towers, just a few blocks uh, south of where we are right now, just a few blocks south in what was Ground Zero. Um, this, huh? this car here, we believe was probably a, uh, a police car, because if you can look at the front dashboard, you can see the radio display at the computer um, uh, terminal, or what was once a computer terminal uh, and uh, a, a computer keyboard. We also found some police reports in the car. Uh, so it's unclear, of course, whether this car was uh, a vehicle that had been stationed there or whether this uh, person or the crew that was driving this car were responding to the scene. Uh, if you look just down uh, past here, you'll see two cars. Uh, and from this vantage point, you can get a really good sense, I think, of the impact, the profound impact of this blast. Uh, unrecognizable, other than the fact that you can see what was once an engine completely covered in debris and soot, and what was once a wheel. Obviously, these were steel uh, radio uh, uh, belted wheels and and now what is left are just the the stringy wires uh, around the rim of this thing you know as I've been uh, spending some time down on this street which has become a, a pretty important artery uh, we've been seeing rescue workers uh, coming in and out some of the new rescue workers who are relieving the the folks who have been working uh, all night some of them arm in arm hands over each other's shoulders clearly getting very emotional about this. Um, 
a lot of pedestrians have walked by this street and they stop whenever they see these vehicles, which were obviously pulled so that the rescue workers can continue doing their very good work. And they look at these vehicles with complete incredulity. Um, I see many of them standing there, sometimes uh, two and three at a time, friends or, or family who obviously live in the neighborhood, looking at these cars, gazing, and, and, and I think this cars, seeing the shell of these cars is, is giving a lot of people, at least the people who live here and maybe some of our viewers at home, just a very true sense of what the impact must have been like and what it must have been like to, to be one of the many thousands of people who uh, were there when the impact uh, first occurred. Just down here we have a car that's in uh, slightly better shape but tells a story in its own way. Maybe it was a few blocks um, farther away, farther north, farther, uh, slightly further away from the impact. And as you can see on its front window, the word scrawled W-A-R, war, because I suppose that's what it feels like. Paula? Boy, I'll take you, I tell you, it's going to take a while for anybody to digest the images you're seeing now. Michael, I know it is very difficult to get any information out of rescue workers now. Obviously, everybody's working so hard to, to try to, to uh, perhaps even rescue folks at this time. Have you been given any information from paramedics about what is going on at Ground Zero? Well, what we've heard right now is that people are working tirelessly. They're working in very long shifts that they're getting very emotionally involved in what they're finding. Um, I'm, I'm trying not to be gruesome about this, but to be very accurate, frankly, about it. They're finding more body parts than they're actually finding bodies. And some of the rescue workers, um, obviously getting very emotionally attached to this particular task, say that they're concerned that they may not be, they may, there are some people who may never be identified, whose entire bodies may never be found. Um, We've also talked to somebody who's been intimately involved in the rescue and search effort, who tells us that they found what they believe to be at least one of the wheels of one of the planes that crashed into the Twin Towers four blocks away from where the Twin Towers were. So again, that gives you a sense of what the impact was like. And there's no telling what else we may find within this perimeter. It's interesting, the rec rescue workers are working right inside what you would call ground zero, or the, 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 um, the heart of the explosion and the blast. But when you talk to more rescue workers and you talk to police officers and, and, and other local authorities here, they will tell you that the damage that was sustained by that, imp by that blast spread many blocks beyond that. And I think just by just telling you that, that the wheel of one of the plans, what they believe to be one of the plans being found blocks away, gives you some, some sense of, of that. Michael, can you tell us if the smoke seems any thicker down there now? From our platform here, it appears though, and I know the winds have shifted a little bit, that, that the plume is even uh, larger than uh, an hour ago. Right. Well, I can tell you this much. It may be because I'm getting used to this, which is probably bad news. Um, but it doesn't quite feel the way that it felt even just 30 minutes ago. Um, it's constantly changing. I'm going to ask William if you could just swing by and look up here. We are underneath essentially what has become very, a very recognizable plume of smoke. You can see this from just about any place in Manhattan right now. And in, in fact, you can see it from New Jersey. You can see it from parts of the other boroughs outside of Manhattan, from Brooklyn to Queens. Um, and what I can tell you is that it's, it's been very interesting. Again, met one of the many vehicles that, that pass us as we've been standing here for the past hour or so. What I can tell you is that it doesn't feel as, as severe as it was. It, it, it smelled very much like you were, you were standing in the middle of, uh, of, of the embers of a bonfire. No longer smells that way. The colors of, the, of this cloud seem to change by the minute. Just moments ago, it was a very thick black and now it looks uh, like a white, sort of grayish, as if you're almost flying through the clouds in the air. Paula? All right, thank you, Michael. Put that mask on. I, I know that uh, the uh, health workers down there advising all of you that are in that close to put the mask on. Uh, before we go back to Atlanta, I wanted to share something with you that some of you might find disturbing. 
Because the winds have shifted, uh, some of the wreckage is blowing uh, to parts of Manhattan, even a couple of miles away from here. Uh, Peter Stiles is a correspondent of ours. He lives, uh, we are told, about two and a half miles from here. I wanted to share with you some of the paperwork that ended up blowing into his yard. Uh, you will see this sheet is just simple notes, maybe with some phone numbers. This is an order slip from Cantor Fitzgerald, which is a bond company um, that was housed in, in one of the, the three buildings that collapsed. Um, this particular piece of paper probably will sicken many of you. It is a sheet explaining health coverage from employees, explaining that early retirees' health coverage cannot be terminated. And this last sheet I'm going to share with you that blew up into the yard of Peter, St Peter Stiles is an actual list of people, people vile, sorry, uh, a, a list of participants in a deferred vested benefit plan, actually listing 10 or 11 people who had vested interests at this point, even describing uh, the, uh, the value of those benefits. Uh, once again, uh, People all over Manhattan are reporting uh, smelling smoke stronger than they have smelled uh, over the last 48 hours. Uh, the, the schools are indeed open today, uh, all public schools that is at least in the majority of the parochial schools. And uh, once again we are told that the stock exchanges may open as early as tomorrow. If they don't open tomorrow they will open on Monday. The city is working very hard to clear some of the arteries moving south of here. You can't even get down to Wall Street now because uh, many of these streets are being used as a staging area for the rescue effort. So, uh, Leon, uh, that's what I've got for now. And, um, you know, I don't know what your reaction was to this paperwork, but I know that it got an awful lot of people here. Boy, I, I can tell you my immediate reaction was a bit of a twinge uh, in, the, in the gut to, to see something like that. It really, really, really puts a human face on on what happened uh, just 48, just uh, more than 48 hours ago. Thanks, Paula. Well, uh, Paula mentioned uh, how difficult travel is around New York. Uh, we know travel around the country has been nearly impossible for many. What you're looking at now is a live picture that we have set up from the Department of Transportation, and we're expecting any minute now the Secretary of Transportation, Norm Mineta, is going to be coming out and announcing uh, that there will be a reopening of the airports across the country under certain guidelines and certain conditions. And we'll get more information on that when that press conference gets underway, and we'll get there live. Uh, well, actually, we'll, we may end up having to stick around for a couple of minutes. Uh, nothing. No, apparently we do not have a press conference right now. We were going to be having another guest, but uh, that's going to have to be delayed for yeah. just a moment. Darren, over to you. Uh, that's how it happens when we have a live television. We will get to that guest. Very important topic to talk about. How do we talk to our kids about uh, what has taken place and how do you keep them from being scared? Someone who knows a lot, a lot about that, father of two, also one of our best correspondents here at CNN. Marty Savage is in New York City, made his way up there and uh, brings us more coverage from there. Martin. you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We can't see you, though. There you are. All right. There we are. Well, let me tell you exactly what is going on right now. And there is an intensive search and rescue effort that is underway. Specifically, though, we are hearing reports it is focusing on an individual, a survivor who is believed to be trapped in the sub-basement underneath of Building 1. We know more details about this, but I am right now hesitant to tell them about you because tell them to you because I don't want to give families out there, thousands of families, any false hope. But at this particular point, we know that this person has been communicating with authorities over a cell phone, was heard most recently, we were told, by a rescuer at about 4.30 this morning. Now, the problem is there's tons and tons of steel trapped over this specific position. And the effort right now is to try to lift that steel out of the way. We saw a short while ago an army of iron workers that have come in. They have joined the throng of rescuers on site here. And they are literally cutting away piece by piece the pieces that made up the Twin Towers. Now, we've been showing you the automobiles. We've been showing you the pieces of paper. But quite frankly, if you want the most graphic depiction of what has transpired on the tragedy, walk to the end of the block down here. Twin 110-story buildings now have been reduced to a pile of rubble that stands about 100 feet tall. That is the clearest example of the devastation that has been visited on New York City here. And as the workers try to go in and do their job there, many of them now are putting on repelling harnesses. They are using ropes because they are literally attaching themselves to any strong points that they can find 
because that pile is so loose and so capable of shifting. So they use these harnesses, attach themselves, and clamber down much like mountain climbers. They do not believe that any survivors are now going to be found above ground. They have been certain. Marty, I'm sorry, we're going to have to interrupt you. We'll get back to you in a moment. Want to take our viewers to Pennsylvania. This is an FBI news conference, the latest on United Airlines Flight 93. Um, as we've talked about yesterday and we'll continue to talk about until it's resolved, the other priority that we're working on is the black box, the voice recorder. We're, as of right now, we have not, it has not been located. We're confident that we're going to keep working on it and we will uh, account for it. And as I said, that is the other investigative, uh, that's the investigative priority right now is to locate that. We're still doing the grid searches. Um, we're working on uh, covering the entire crime scene and we'll go wherever the evidence leads us. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, questions regarding uh, the flight path. There's an awful lot of information out there. Uh, a, we have determined that the flight was heading in an eastern direction. And that's coming from the NTSB. Beyond that, anything else is, would be speculative on our part, and we really don't want to go any further than that, but we will confirm that the plane was heading in an easterly direction. That's coming from the NTSB. The, uh, to give you a little bit of an idea of how we're operating up there, uh, one of the questions to us has been how many uh, agencies are up there and who are they? One of the things, we have tremendous amount of agencies that are up there with personnel and it fluctuates on a daily basis depending on the needs of that day. What we've been doing is who's ever up there, they have their own meetings and their own objectives, whatever the organization is, whether it be the Red Cross trying to get enough food for the workers and for, and for you, all the way to any leads that are being generated from the state police or the FBI or any other federal law enforcement. All the different agencies are up there trying to work and do the job that, that what they're here for. They're meeting all the heads of the different agencies that are up for that particular day meet twice. They meet at 9 a.m. and they meet at 2 p.m. and basically they go around the room and everybody talks about what it is that they've accomplished and what it is that they're working on. And then at that point uh, the people who need to know have a good idea of how things are working, how things are funneling, so we have a clue what's going on and people know what's what's happening here on this site. Now that's only for this site. And as you're well aware, uh, the FBI alone has over 4,000 uh, agents working not only nationwide but worldwide trying to track down any leads. Um, it's a lot, a lot of information. Uh, anything of an investigative nature that will be released will be released out of Washington, D.C., most likely from either the uh, Attorney General or the President or the Director of the FBI. Uh, we're focused here on what's going on here on a day-to-day -day basis. That's what we hope to uh, convey to you with our press conferences that we're going to have twice daily. Um, and that's what we're focusing on. There's been a lot of questions regarding the crater itself. Uh, according to people who have been involved in these investigations, such as the NTSB and the state police, when, a, when the plane goes in uh, on, a, on the ground, there's a tendency, for an, obviously, for an awful lot of dirt to be moved. Uh, and dust, as you can tell from the roads We've around We've been listening here, in on an FBI area. news conference, the latest on the crash of United Airlines Flight 93. That's the one that was on its way from Newark to San Francisco when it crashed on Tuesday morning. Still have not recovered the black box, yet they're still hopeful they will find it. The grid process goes on, and they also had more information that the NTSB is saying that they do know at this point that that plane was headed in an easterly direction when it crashed. More information on that just ahead right now. Here's Leon. Well, actually, I'd like to I hate to do this over the air, but I must ask the producers. I just now see that uh, Transportation Secretary Norman, Norman Mineta is now at the podium. We want to hear what he has In to say right now. In order to restore our security to the fullest extent possible, we exercise the necessary precautions while assessing our nation's transportation systems. Now I am pleased to announce some good news for travelers, for our economy, and for the restoration of America's freedom of mobility. Effective 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time today, our national airspace system will reopen to commercial aviation. At this moment, the FAA reports that we have airports starting to reopen across the country. 
Now, this decision was made after a series of meetings throughout the day, yesterday, and late into Wednesday night with the White House and other Cabinet officials, Federal Aviation Administrator Jane Garvey and her great team, aviation industry leaders, as well as intelligence and law enforcement representatives. I must caution everyone that a system as diverse and complex as ours cannot be brought up instantly. And so we will be reopening airports and airlines will be resuming their flights since as they meet the new security uh, measures that we are now imposing. Additional airports will be opened only after they meet the new stringent security measures. Anyone planning on flying today, or not even today, but henceforth, I only recommend that you contact the number that I gave you. Uh, people are in route. As we've been told that people are in route. That's coming from United Airlines, and they are supposed to go to that location, the Seven Springs Resort location, and that would be your best bet on where to get information on the families. Is anybody coordinating access to the families? Otherwise, it's going to be 50 media representatives. That is going to be coordinated through and United Airlines. I have to Airlines. apologize I for the, the switch in the audio there of that transmission we were getting from the Department of Transportation. Unfortunately, that was not under our control. We did get the top of the report there that uh, Transportation Secretary Normanetta has announced that the skies over the America will begin opening at as of 11 a.m. Eastern Time. The process of reopening is going to be a gradual one because he says that with a system as diverse and as broad as the, as the one that does exist here in the U.S., it can't be done instantaneously. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think we now have the audio problem straightened up. Let's go back to will that report. It will take place before passengers are allowed to board any aircraft. Uh, we have discontinued off-airport check-in and curbside check-in at the airport. All passengers will be required to go to the ticket counters to check in. Uh, we must reserve boarding areas for passengers only and only ticketed passengers will be allowed to proceed past airport screeners. And all vehicles near airport terminals will be monitored more closely. We experienced an unprecedented assault on our commercial aviation system. And in times such as these, we will use all available resources to ensure the safety of our travelers. Agents from the Department of Justice and from the Department of Treasury will be, employed to air, uh, will be deployed to airports across the country. The added presence of these officers will augment our existing heightened security procedures, serving as a visible reminder of our strong commitment to protect the safety of the American people and the traveling public. Again, I strongly urge all passengers to allow plenty of time to deal with the heightened security procedures and also to exercise patience with airport and airline employees and security personnel. Finally, let me say this. From this day forward, we are operating with tightened security. In the weeks and months ahead, we will do all that we can to ensure that the safety of the American aviation system is in place. We will not allow this enemy to win the war by restricting our freedom of mobility. I wish again to express my hope that all Americans will heed the President's call to keep the victims and their families in our prayers and our thoughts as we go about the task of recovering and rebuilding. I will now take uh, questions. Uh, what is the situation now with <clears throat> general aviation, with business aviation, and the cargo carriers? 
Uh, first of all, the cargo carriers are not being differentiated, differentiated uh, from the commercial passenger uh, airliners. Uh, there are certain requirements being put on them in terms of security uh, and safety measures, but uh, they are uh, back in the air again, effective 11 a.m. On private or general aviation, rather, uh, I will have a little more uh, on that subject uh, later this day. But right now, this is uh, a uh, announcement only as it relates to the commercial and cargo airline. As of 11 a.m., you can't go out and hop in your Cessna and take off. No, sir. Okay. Mr. Secretary. Um, Mr. Secretary, some say We've been listening to the Transportation Secretary, Normanetta, and make the announcement that uh, things in the skies over America will be getting back to normal sometime fairly soon. He announced that the airports and, will, and airlines will begin the process of uh, going back to regular service. He did announce, though, a number of restrictions that passengers should expect and now have to endure. Number one, them being off airport and curbside check-in will no longer be allowed. The boarding areas at most at all airports will only be accessible for ticketed passengers only. And all vehicles that are, are near terminals are going to be monitored more closely. And he's also advising that passengers allow for plenty of extra time now for these added security measures. And he's also asking for extra patience, which is no doubt going to be needed. We'll continue to monitor that and bring you any other new developments that come out on that angle. But we want to move on and get to a store, uh, an angle of this that we've been trying to get to for some time now. And that is, what do you do with your children or the children in your family that may be trying to, to deal with or in, in their minds grapple with what has happened here, the, the tragedy that hit this country on Tuesday? We're joined this morning by Dr. Alvin Poussin, who's been standing by very patiently, I should add, uh, with us in Boston, Massachusetts this morning. And, and Doctor, thank you very much for bearing with us through the different breaking news mm -hmm. that we've had today and yesterday, as a matter of fact, as well. We're very glad to have you, and, and because most of us in this building have a lot of respect and we are very familiar with your work on this topic and dealing with children for over the years and I want to ask you first of all do you suggest that parents actually engage children on this issue even if they have the children that is even if the children have not begun to ask questions on their own uh, not with very young children in fact I think uh, children below the age of seven probably shouldn't even be watching these events uh, on television but unfortunately, many, many young children did because the parents had the television sets on because they were so anxious to follow the events. Mm -hmm. And the children saw a lot of the atrocities and, and, and the tragedy and, and, and the violence associated with, with what, what happened and were very, very terrified and fearful. In those cases, the parents have to reassure those children uh, and, and make them feel safe and try to explain to them that children will have questions about what, what's going on, what's happening, and they have to tell them the truth, that some, some angry people who are angry against the United States uh, committed this awful act and blew up the buildings and killed people and injured people, and, but to also then reassure them that they are safe. Children will, will very quickly personalize these types of tragedies, and they'll wonder whether uh, someone's going to blow up their school, someone's right. going to blow up their they are building uh, in their town, whether their parents are safe going to work. So they're going to have a lot of fear and anxiety. Well, let me ask you, and since you, you go to that point, to hit two things I do want to talk to you about. Number one, schools. Number, number two, well, let's begin with this one first of all. The, the, what do you, how do you approach a child with that and, and talk to him about the things like that? You just mentioned the, the vulnerabilities that their parents may have when they go to work or what, what may happen to them when they go to school. Well, how do you talk to a child about that and avoid in, I guess, in, in avoid instilling some sense of victimhood. Well, I, I think that one of the things is that we're not, com the society is not completely safe, and parents already teach their children how to, how to protect themselves. We, we did a lot of that after the, the school shootings and so on, so many of them know that things are not completely safe. So I think in this situation, you tell them, just like you did after the school shootings, that you're trying to make the, everything as safe as possible for them, that the, the government is, the FBI is, the, the aviation industry is, and that, they, that you are safe. And also, particularly for children outside of New York and Washington, that it's not something like that is likely to happen to them. Well, doctor, I want, doctor, I'm sorry to interrupt. I want to cut you off because it sounds like your microphone just fell off. I want to give you a chance to, to find it. 
and pick it up because I, I want people to hear this point that you're making. And folks, you have to understand yeah, this is, I, here we go, man. This yeah. is live television, and, and, <laughs> and this is uh, the kind of thing that does happen from time to time. So I want to let you begin at, at that remark again, Doctor, because I think it's very important. The idea of what it is that you're supposed to be talking to children about who don't live in New York, children yeah. who are outside of the areas of Washington or D.C. or New York where these things have happened. Yeah, the children who live outside, I think you can tell them they're relatively safe. They haven't experienced it directly like the children have in Washington, D.C., uh, in New York, who I think are suffering another level of, of, of trauma uh, because of it and another level of fear. So they're going to need even more attention, just like the adults there uh, are suffering from a lot of losses and, and grief. Yeah. I think children who live in other parts of the country, you can pretty much reassure them that they're safe and that the government is doing all that they can and will track down the perpetrators and this is not likely to, to happen in their community and then give them a lot of support a lot of family spirit togetherness mm -hmm. and and it will help them well, I know there are children already who have been watching this these events on television and have had nightmares and are very very anxious about what might happen to them but I think with support from the family and so on that this will this will pass and they'll be okay wise words we but it will take some time also schools can do things some some children want to feel like they're able to help you know if they if they wrote some poems if they wrote uh, had some art drawings and so on that they made uh, for the families or to the victims and so on gives them a chance to, to show that they also care and I think helps to relieve a lot of the, the grief and pain that they're feeling. Dr. Alvin Poussaint, we thank you very much for bearing with us this morning. We appreciate your words of wisdom. We certainly hope that they have been digested out there. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, let's go now from Boston up to New York and Paula. All right, Leon. Um as you know, uh, there's a lot of new information coming in, and we're all kind of scrambling. I wanted to alert you to the fact that very shortly, Governor Pataki of New York, Mayor Giuliani of New York City, and the president will be holding a conference call. We have every reason to believe we're going to be able to show you that. We're going to be able to eavesdrop in on that conversation, legally, of course, I might add. Um, but as we wait for that call to get underway, I just want to quickly bring you up to date on what is going on in uh, this part of the country. Uh, we have some pictures now of Kennedy Airport, which will show uh, for you that uh, they are opening up to, to limited service. And you just heard Transportation Director uh, Manetta describing how uh, travelers, if they choose to travel over the next couple of weeks, uh, well, forever, I guess we're told, they will see increased security. That's not apparent from these pictures, but uh, clearly uh, the airports, in order to open up to this kind of service, have to... Um, put into effect some new security guidelines. Uh, Mr. Mineta mentioned that there will be no, no longer will, will there be any curbside check-in. Only ticketed passengers will be allowed through security. No knives of any kind will be allowed to be taken on board. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there is going to be a much higher standard used for employing uh, security personnel. Uh, in addition to this, we're just beginning uh, to get a sense of, of the scale of the tragedy witnessed here in New York City. The uh, mayor of New York City confirming that some 4,763 people are on the missing list. Uh, some 94 bodies have been recovered so far, not all of those identified. Uh, right now, I'm going to check in with Kelly Wallace, who is standing by at the White House. Kelly, we haven't heard much about uh, what the president has been doing today. Can you fill us in on that? Absolutely. Just like yourself, Paula, we are waiting. We know the president expected to make a telephone call. We were told to Mayor Giuliani, you adding more information there that Governor Pataki will be joining that call. The president really to say that the full weight of the government is out there to help New York City, Pennsylvania, certainly the Pentagon deal with search and rescue operations. We know, Paula, the president was in the Oval Office shortly after 7 a.m., getting his daily national security and intelligence briefings. He also, Paula, has been working the phones, continuing to build what this White House has been calling an international coalition against terrorism. He called the Prime Minister of Japan, the Prime Minister of Italy, Lord Robertson of NATO, and Crown Prince Abdullah of Saudi Arabia. Ari Fleischer, the president's spokesman, saying all four. 
expressing their condolences and sympathies to the American people and also saying that all four stand united against terrorism. Paula, you've heard us. We've been reporting that the White House trying to build this sort of international consensus, reporters pressing Ari Fleischer to say what is the U.S. government asking of these countries? Is the U.S. asking for military assistance, economic assistance to place sanctions against any country? When and if the U.S. Uh, retaliates, Fleischer would not respond, but he said it's more than rhetoric that the U.S. is asking for, for support from these countries. We also know, Paula, the president will be going to a local hospital in the Washington, D.C. area later this morning to visit with some of the families of the victims affected by, obviously, the plane crash at the Pentagon and to thank the doctors and nurses who are helping the victims. And, Paula, as you've been reporting, there was some interesting information that also came out from Ari Fleischer concerning Air Force One. We, of course, were told by the White House yesterday that the White House had real and credible, those are the words in the White House, uh, the White House was using information that the White House and Air Force One were targets of these hijackers. A report in today's New York Times, Carl Rove, one of the president's top political advisors, telling the New York Times that there was a telephone threat that came into Air Force One as the president was leaving Sarasota, Florida, and as that plane was in the air. Carl Rove telling the New York Times that that threat was deemed credible and therefore that is why the president went off to a military base in Louisiana and then to Nebraska. Ari Fleischer telling us again that that information is correct. Ari Fleischer saying that this caller told whoever the person talking to that Air Force One is a target. Ari Fleischer was asked if the caller used the code name for Air Force One and he said in, uh, the caller did in fact use that code name and that is why White House officials deemed this a credible threat and why that plane was re re rerouted to Louisiana. And one other, I know we're throwing a lot at you all, one other piece of information, Paula, President will be declaring today that tomorrow should be a national day of prayer and remembrance. The President will be going and attending a local church service here in Washington and at that point in time he will be asking Americans on their lunch hours tomorrow to go to a church, a synagogue, a mosque and to pray for the victims and their families of the tragedy facing the United States. Paula, back to you. Kelly, I wanted to go back to a point you made much earlier on, and you were talking about the efforts underway at the White House and the kinds of phone calls are being made to establish even greater support uh, for the United States. I think Colin Powell made it very clear to me in an interview yesterday that in order to fight this kind of terrorism, uh, that, that uh, the United States is going to have to build even stronger bridges, uh, bridges that is, with, with friendly nations. Uh, I don't know whether you got to hear Christiane Amanpour's interview with Jacques Chirac, but she asked him a, a pointed question question about France not necessarily always uh, being in 100 percent agreement with some United States policies and asked him the extent to which France would continue to be involved with fighting terrorism. And uh, he basically said that, that uh, they're going to have to see how this thing proceeds, but obviously offered the backing of, of the French government. Can you give us any analysis of the, the level of support the president expects from, from Western European nations? Well, I think uh, Ari Fleischer was sort of asked that. I did not hear Christiane Amanpour's interview, but we were sort of asking Ari Fleischer exactly why is sort of the U.S. trying to build this international consensus? Does it feel it needs that before it takes any military action if it decides to take such, such action? And Fleischer said that uh, looking at the U.N. Security Council, that it passing a resolution condemning this, saying that the attacks against the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, really were attacks against the security of the United States, and that affects the entire world. So the situation, the magnitude of the situation, you get the sense from White House officials because of the number of victims, because of the World Trade Center, the Pentagon being attacked, that this administration is reaching out and that getting more support than uh, maybe it, it has in previous cases because of the magnitude of the situation. And you're also getting the sense here, Paula, that Again, it's not clear what the U.S. is asking for, if it's asking for additional military support, if it's asking for countries like France to join together and slam sanctions against a country, if a country is deemed responsible to support any terrorism. Not clear what the U.S. is asking for, but it's clear that the administration is trying to aid determine who is responsible. But it is also sort of looking at this opportunity to take a stronger, maybe more of a long-term battle against terrorism and trying to sort of build that international coalition to make sure that those responsible are taken out, if you will, but also to make sure that something like this never happens again. So the gravity of the situation seems to be why the U.S. is, is expecting and counting on the support of really the entire world. Paula. 
Kelly, any reaction there to the news conference some Pakistani officials held earlier today? Pakistanis, uh, or at least the officials at least, uh, showing uh, great regret about what happened in this attack, saying they clearly, uh, in their words, are against terrorism. And yet, uh, no one should forget that, that Pakistan is one of three governments that actually recognizes the Taliban government, uh, the religious group now in, in, in charge of Afghanistan. Any reaction to that at all? Well, that is exactly why it is significant. We don't really have any new reaction to that latest briefing. We do know that the U.S. ambassador uh, to Pakistan met with General Musharraf, the military leader of Pakistan today, coming out of that meeting, saying that the general sort of gave a very positive statement, a strong statement, that Pakistan sort of stands with the United States. That is significant for just the reasons you mentioned, that Pakistan, and I believe it's the United Arab Emirates and uh, one other country, only three that recognize the Taliban as sort of the ruling government of Afghanistan. So it's very significant because if Pakistan is sort of stepping back, it means that Afghanistan could be further isolated. And obviously, if the U.S. government determines that, A, Osama bin Laden or his network were involved in this and that the Taliban might be providing safe haven for Osama bin Laden, well, then Afghanistan losing the support of the Pakistanis there. Paula, back to you. All right, Kelly, I'm just going to quickly fill in some time here before this conference gets underway between uh, the governor of New York and the mayor of New York City with the president. Uh, we have just gotten information that LaGuardia Airport, which is one of the three area port airports that has just opened, is now being evacuated. Uh, we have no idea what that means, and as soon as we get more information on that, we'll bring it to you. Uh, of course, uh, you heard uh, Transportation Secretary Mineta talking about the new security guidelines that will be in place in airports across the nation. Here's the president picking up the phone, talking to New York's top leaders. Thank you all very much for taking my phone call. Uh, first of all, I can't tell you how uh, sad I am in America is for uh, the people of New York City and the tri-state area. Uh, I want to let you know there's a quiet anger in America that uh, really is real. And uh, also, though, I can't tell you how proud I am of the good citizens of, that, of your part of the world and the extraordinary job uh, you all are doing. You're doing a really a great job on behalf of the citizens of uh, uh, New York City, New York State, and in the tri-state area. So I, I, I want to thank you very much for your leadership and dedication. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Secondly, uh, I've been in touch with you all, and uh, uh, you've extended me a kind invitation to come to New York City. Uh, I accept. I'll be there tomorrow afternoon after the prayer service at the National Cathedral. I look forward to uh, joining with both of you and thanking the police and fire, the construction trade workers, the restaurant owners, the volunteers, all of whom have uh, really made a, a, you know, a, a huge display for the world to see of the compassion of America and the bravery of America and the strength of America. Um, every world leader I've talked to uh, in recent days has been impressed by what they have uh, seen about our nation and the fabric of our nation. And uh, I want to thank everybody when I come. So thank you for your hospitality. Well, Mr. President, thank you for uh, coming to New York. I'm sure that's going to be uh, a great inspiration to all of us, and particularly those thousands of men and women still downtown trying to help us with the rescue efforts. I also want to thank you for all the help we've gotten from the federal government. It's been tremendous. Uh, and for your words, uh, you are right. Our nation is united as never before, and we will triumph over this evil with your leadership uh, and your inspiration. And I also have to congratulate the mayor for the tremendous effort he has made. Mr. President, you would be uh, proud uh, of uh, the leadership and the cooperation we've seen here. Uh, the city has taken the lead. Your people have been enormously supportive, and we're very grateful. Well, thanks, George I, and Rudy. Thank you all. I, 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 I know you've put in a request, uh, and I've directed the Attorney General uh, to expedite any payments of benefits uh, for uh, uh, those fallen uh, public safety officers uh, to their families, any benefits to their families. And uh, uh, the Attorney General, as I understand, will be making a formal announcement of your request today. I've told Allball anything, 
anything it takes to help New York. I have been in touch with the Congress. They are expediting a supplemental. Uh, the, we've had great, great, great cooperation with members of the Congress in both political parties. Um, so just keep in touch. I know you will. This, this isn't the first time we've talked, and I, I really appreciate the fact that you all are in charge. And I know the citizens of New York and the tri-state area, people of New, New Jersey and Connecticut, are appreciative as well. Mr. President, the, uh, the uniformed offices, the police, the fire, the emergency service offices, uh, their families will, will really appreciate this. We're, we're going to sustain a tremendous loss of our bravest and our, our best people. And the uh, relief that you're now making available to the families, it's going to mean a lot to them. They're, they're, they're going to be able to think about the fact that their children are going to be taken care of, that they're going to be able to go to college, that they're going to be able to carry on. So I, I can't express to you how appreciative we are of your acting so swiftly. And also, on that terrible day when our city was being attacked, you were in immediate communication with us, Mr. President, and helped to secure the city. And uh, the work you've done for us, uh, we all e eternally appreciate. Uh, you've been a terrific leader, and uh, we're taking direction from you, and we're following your example. You've done a terrific job, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Rudy, and thanks, George. Let me make it clear to you all, as my close friends, that uh uh, my mindset is this. One, I, I, I'm weep and mourn with America. I'm going to a hospital right after this to comfort families. I wish I could comfort every single family whose lives have been affected. But na make no mistake about it, my resolve is steady and strong about uh, winning this war that has been declared on America. It's a new kind of war. I understand it's a new kind of war. And this government will adjust. And this government will call others to join us to make sure this act, these acts, um, uh, the people who conducted these acts, and those who harbor them are held accounted, accountable for their actions. Make no mistake. As we do so, I urge, uh, uh, I know I don't need to tell you all this, but our nation must be um, mindful that there are thousands of Arab Americans who live in New York City, love their flag just as much as uh, the three of us do. We must be mindful that as we, as we seek uh, to win the war, that we treat Arab Americans and uh, Muslims uh, with the respect they deserve. I know that is your attitudes as well, certainly the attitude of this government, that we should not hold one who uh, is a Muslim responsible for an act of terror. We will hold those who are responsible for the terrorist acts accountable and those who harbor them. Um, you'll see, and I look forward to visiting with you in person tomorrow, uh, about, uh, about the resolve of this government. And, uh, and so I thank you very much for your leadership on the ground. I, um, I, I wish I was visiting under uh, better circumstances, but it, it will be a chance for all three of us to, to thank and hug and, and cry with the citizens of your good area. Thank you very much, Mr. President. We, we really appreciate this very much. Mr. President, we're looking forward to your visit. It, it will inspire us all, and we will be with you when the United States takes firm and appropriate action to those who Absolutely. conducted this evil. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. All right, you just, all right, you've just been able to uh, hear the president talking to the two block leaders of New York, Governor Pataki, Rudy Giuliani, talking, uh, the president announcing, in fact, that after attending a prayer service at the National Cathedral tomorrow, he will head on to New York where he plans to work or actually uh, try to uh, make contact with the hundreds of rescue Increased workers on duty. Here's audience. the president again. Um, yes, I would, if a family member asked whether they should fly, I'd say yes. Mr. President, uh, how close are you, sir, to finding out, to nailing down who is responsible for these acts and what kind of international coalition are you trying to build? Is it similar to the one your father built for the Persian Gulf War? I am, um, first let me uh, condition the press this way. Any uh, 
sources and methods of intelligence will remain um, uh, guarded in secret. My administration will not talk about um, how we gather intelligence, if we gather intelligence, and what the intelligence says. That's for the protection of the American people. Uh, it is uh, important as we battle this enemy, we conduct ourselves that way. Secondly, I've been on the phone this morning, just like I was yesterday, and we'll be on this afternoon on the phone with um, leaders from around the world who express their solidarity with this nation's intention to route out and to whip terrorism. Uh, they understand, fully understand, that um, that an act of war was declared on the United States of America. They understand as well that that act could have easily been declared on them. Th these people can't stand freedom. They hate our values. They hate what America stands for. Many of the leaders understand it could have easily have happened to them. Secondly, they understand that unlike previous war, uh, this enemy likes to hide. They heard my call loud and clear to those who feel like they can provide safe harbor for the terrorists, that we will hold them responsible as well. And they joined me in understanding not only the concept of, uh, uh, of the enemy, that, that, that the enemy is a different type of enemy. They joined me in also in solidarity about holding those uh, who fund them, who harbor them, who encourage them responsible for their activities. I, I'm pleased with the outpouring of support. Zhang Men, Vladimir Putin, um, had a great visit this morning with uh, His Royal Highness Prince Abdullah of Saudi Arabia. I will continue to stay on the phone. And there is universal support for the American people, sadness in their voice, but understanding that we have just seen the first war of the 21st century. And there is universal approval of um, of uh, the statements I have made, and I am confident there will be universal approval of the actions this government takes. Yeah, stretch. Mr. President, uh, if this is a different kind of war, it might require perhaps a different kind of coalition. Many people believe that for a real war on terrorism to work, you'll need cooperation from governments that haven't necessarily done so in the past, specifically Pakistan and Afghanistan. Have you I made would, any progress on that front? I would, I, would, I would refer you to the statements that uh, the Pakistani leader gave about his, I don't have the exact words in front of me, but his willingness to work with the United States. And I appreciate that statement. And now we'll just find out what that means, won't we? We'll, we will, we will, we will uh, 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 we will give the Pakistani government a chance to cooperate and to participate as we hunt down uh, those people who committed this unbelievable, despicable act on America. Mr. President, how confident are you that Osama bin Laden is behind these attacks? Do you know what his whereabouts are? And secondly, what kind of support are you looking for from Congress in terms of your willingness to act? We are, um, we will not discuss uh, intelligence matters how we gather intelligence, and what we know. Uh, secondly, I am uh, about anybody. Uh, when our government acts, you'll be informed. Uh, secondly, uh, I am, we had a great meeting yesterday here in the cabinet room with uh, leadership uh, of the House and the Senate. I was touched by their response their encouragement, and their willingness to work together. And um, I would be very pleased to see a strong resolution come out of Congress uh, supporting the administration and what we intend to do. And we're working closely with Congress. Secondly, progress is being made on a supplemental. I thought that was very swift action. And I'm most appreciative, again, of uh, Senator Daschle and Representative Gephardt, as well as my Republican colleagues uh, for 
really showing solidarity again and uniting the nation. Now is the time for the country to be united. And, uh, um, you know, through the tears of sadness, I see an opportunity. You know, make no mistake about it, this nation is sad. But we're also tough and resolute. And now's an opportunity to do uh, generations a favor by coming together and whipping terrorism, hunting it down, finding it, and holding them accountable. Uh, the nation must understand this is now the focus of my administration. We will be very much engaged in domestic policy, of course. I look forward to working with Congress on a variety of issues. But now that war has been declared on us, we will lead the world to victory, to victory. President, of the threat to Air Force One, and do you believe that the terrorists attempted to assassinate you, sir? I will not discuss the intelligence that our country has gathered. Um, do you believe these, tried to assassinate you? I believe I took the, I know, I don't believe, I know I took the appropriate actions as the commander in chief to be in a position to be able to uh, make the decisions necessary for our government to handle the crisis. Uh, you didn't hear the end of the phone call with the, the mayor and uh, George Pataki, uh, both of whom thanked me for the fact that we are immediately on the phone with them uh, from Air Force One, and our government responded quickly. Uh, how do you feel knowing you're under Mr. personal President, threat? Could you give us a sense as to what kind of prayers you are uh, thinking and where your heart is um, for yourself as you well, work on that? Well, I think about myself right now. I think about the families, the children. Um, I'm, a, I'm a loving guy. And I'm also someone, however, who's got a job to do. And I intend to do it. And um, this is a terrible moment. But this country will not relent until we have saved ourselves and others from the terrible tragedy that came upon America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A very emotional President Bush addressing reporters there. We just saw a number of live events with the president. He was talking to reporters just after he had a conference call with Mayor Giuliani and Governor Pataki, both of New York City and of the state of New York. The, the president, before uh, getting what appeared to be very choked up, talking, uh, repeating a lot of statements that he said over the last couple of days, once again reiterating that he considers this an act of war, this act on America, saying there is no safe harbor for the terrorists who have carried this out, nor f no safe harbor for the countries that could be supporting or harboring the terrorists. And he talked of support coming from other countries around the world, uh, mentioning Russia, Saudi Arabia, and also, I think, making allusion to Jordan as well. Um, let's bring in our Kelly Wallace, who we were talking with before we went ahead and listened to this conference call and also we're listening to the talk with reporters. Kelly, question for you. One of the reporters was asking a lot about the Pakistani government and the level of support. If, if our viewers were with us earlier today, you saw leaders of Pakistan come out and hold a news conference and make a statement. Why is there a question at this point how much support the government of Pakistan is offering and why is it important to America to have that support? Well, it's important, Darren, because Pakistan and then it's just the United Arab Emirates and also Saudi Arabia, only the three countries that recognize the Taliban as the ruling government of Afghanistan. Pakistan viewed as really the closest ally to Afghanistan. And obviously, the president in that news conference saying that he will not talk about any intelligence matters, will not talk about the investigation. Privately, though, U.S. officials saying that the evidence is uh, definitely starting to point to the network of Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden is believed to be in Afghanistan, and it is believed that the Taliban has been providing Osama bin Laden safe haven. So when you have Pakistan, General Musharraf, the military ruler of Pakistan, coming out, making a statement, saying that Pakistan stands united with the U.S. government in combating terrorism, if that is true, and as you heard the president, he obviously uh, seemed gratified by that statement, although a little skeptical, of course, wanting to see exactly what the general means by what he says. But if 
that is true. And if the Pakistani government will stand with the U.S. and this sort of international coalition that this White House is trying to build, that would be significant because, again, a lot of ifs here, Darren, but if it is determined that the network of Osama bin Laden is involved, if it is determined that the Taliban has been providing safe haven to Osama bin Laden, then certainly Afghanistan more isolated than before if the Pakistanis step with the U.S. and the world community <coughs> and not with Afghanistan. And Kelly, it sounds like the president once again uh, saying, stating what he's been saying all along to the world, to the countries of the world, either you're with the U.S. or you're against the U.S. And if you're against the U.S., well, good luck to you. Exactly, Darren. You know, we have been talking about sort of the, the U.S. really trying to build this international coalition. You heard the president. He said uh, this is an act of war that has been declared on the U.S. He called this the first war of the 21st century. And he said he is fully confident, based on his conversations, as you noted, with the leaders of Russia and China and Europe and Canada, he is fully confident, he said, that there will be universal support for any action the U.S. takes. But he also said, Darren, you saw that, he said through this time of of great sadness and he said no doubt this nation is tremendously saddened he said he sees this as an opportunity to go out and try and wipe out terrorism to try and hunt it down and we really have been getting the sense from u.s leaders that not only is this administration trying to a determine who happens to be responsible for these attacks and and to try and take those people out but b to make sure this doesn't happen again and to use this as an opportunity to try and destroy any other terrorist cells that might exist around the world darren kelly wallace at the white House. Kelly, thank you very much. And as we tossed over to Leon, actually, we're going to go to Boston. This is former President Bush. He is addressing the Lotus Corporation. Let's go ahead and listen to former President Bush. And we've got to be tolerant. If, as the preliminary evidence suggests, this was an act of bin Laden or some related group, or perhaps an entirely different group of radicals, we should be mindful that these were not the acts of all Muslims who, like Christians and Jews, believe in a God of love and mercy. Rather, these were senseless murders uh, committed by religious extremists who kill out of hate. Uh, I, just since I've been back, since yesterday afternoon, have received letters from high officials in Saudi Arabia and talked <coughs> talk to a friend in, in Kuwait. Uh, messages from China. Uh, and this is just here. Certainly the White House had been inundated with such messages of concern and support. Uh, and finally, I've seen some of the commentary comparing this attack with Pearl Harbor. I'm probably the only guy in this room old enough to remember where I was when Pearl Harbor, when the first reports of Pearl Harbor came in. Uh, and in some respects, there are similarities. For example, just as Pearl Harbor awakened this country from the notion that we could somehow avoid the call to duty and defend freedom in, in Europe and Asia in World War II, so too should this most recent surprise attack erase the concept in some quarters that America can somehow go it alone uh, in the fight against terrorism or in anything else for that matter. But in many respects, this is far more difficult. It is far more difficult to fight an enemy uh, who refuses to show his face. Uh, and so earlier this week, we were confronted head-on once again by one of the remaining great challenges of our post-war post -war, war world, uh, the threat of terrorism. I remember when President Reagan asked me when I was vice president to head up a task force on international terrorism. Uh, we made some good recommendations, uh, but clearly those recommendations couldn't solve the problems that our president and our country face today. Uh, I can tell you, I talk quite regularly to our son. I've been doing that since he was a little kid, uh, and, and will continue to do it. But it's not always about policy. It's not, it's not, what do you think, Dad, I should be doing that kind of thing. It is more the relationship of a cl very close family uh, staying in touch one with the other. Matter of fact, all, all three of his brothers and his sister called me in our little, little uh, um, hotel out there in Wisconsin yesterday, just staying in touch one with the other, as families all across this country are doing. Uh, I think, I know uh, that George is strong. Uh, I know that he has a fantastic national security team around him. I know that in reaching out to the Congress, as we're seeing now, and in reaching out to our friends and allies and others around the world, he is doing the right thing. 
Uh, I've got to confess to being a little annoyed at the attacks on him for following security procedures, uh, not rushing right back to Washington. But as you've seen in today's paper, there was some credible uh, uh, threats on the life of the president, indeed on the White House itself. And so, and, and several people have called to apologize uh, for their premature judgments on that. Uh, he does know what he's doing. Uh, he's blessed with this strong team. And I think he's lifted by the prayers of the American people and the prayers of people around the world. And so I, I ask you to keep our president and the victims in their prayers, in, in your prayers. Uh, pray for the families. Pray for that we will prevail uh, against this threat. We're moved into a different era now. Uh, you saw what NATO did yesterday, and I think that is very, very important, that the alliance stood, is standing firmly with the United States. You're hearing the president has heard from Jiang Zemin in China and from Putin in Russia, and I think this is very important, all denouncing the international terror. So a coalition is kind of in the process of coming together. Uh, and then it'll be the awesome responsibility of the president and his national security team to determine what to do. Uh, the prospects of peace and prosperity in our country, this notwithstanding, have really uh, never been higher. Uh, and yet the world does remain a dangerous place with more instability and unpredictability. People used to ask me when I was still president, well, is the Soviet Union having imploded? Who's the enemy? Why do we need a strong defense? Why do we need all this intelligence? Who's the enemy? And I'd say way back then, I've continued to say the enemy is unpredictability and, of course, instability. Uh, and I think we see the unpredictable nature of the threat uh, just in the, we've seen it just in the last few days. The Soviet bear, the, um, the uh, great superpower is gone. But new dangers have emerged to take this, this, take its place, take the place of, of a kind of superpower confrontation. Uh, regional tensions in Europe and the subcontinent remain. Narco traffickers still threaten your kids and my grandkids. Uh, rogue states such as Iraq and North Korea, unpredictable, uh, but I think presenting still present a very clear threat to to civilized countries in a lot of way. And together with terrorism, all represent, represent threats to the peaceful world that we seek to build. And if I might, might add, all of this and more should reinforce the need for Americans to have the best possible intelligence in the world. You may remember I went to CIA. I was living peacefully in China as the equivalent of your ambassador. I was then uh, head of the liaison office with the title of ambassador because I'd been ambassador at the United Nations. And um, we were bicycling away happily there in China. Uh, in those days, China was isolated, uh, isolated from the rest of the world. And so we couldn't do, uh, seek going to anybody's home. We couldn't be received by many other officials. And I remember bicycling one Sunday uh, back from our little church service in Beijing to the U.S. liaison office. And a messenger came from our embassy or our liaison office and said, uh, Mr. Ambassador, we have a message, important message for you. And I said, uh, he said, you better be sitting down. I said, I am sitting down, right on my bicycle, right here. He said, no, no, this is important. So anyway, it was a uh, request from President Ford that I come back to head the CIA. Uh, I had not. I'd been a consumer of intelligence at the United Nations. I'd known something about it as a congressman, uh, but I had not, uh, I didn't know the, all the technicalities of intelligence. But I went to CIA at a time when CIA had been criticized for properly for some things, but, in, but, but uh, unfairly attacked for many things uh, that it shouldn't have been attacked for. And what happened out of that period was that many of our human intelligence sources dried up. If they see there's some, some uh, muckraker going out to CIA and considering that everybody out there is, is uh, doing something bad or naughty, and if they see the names of, of our intelligence sources released, those sources dry up. And so 
human intelligence is a kind of a dirty business. And in it, you have to deal with unsavory people. Uh, people tried to make a lot out of the fact that at one point the intelligence community dealt with Manuel Noriega. Well, they did, but it isn't a nice, clean business. And if you're going to infiltrate some cell somewhere, or a terrorist cell, you have to deal with people that are willing to betray their country, people that are willing to betray their friends, people that want money or other things. And it's not pleasant. But if we are going to provide the president with the best possible intelligence, uh, we have to have uh, the we have to free up the intelligence system from some of its constraints. You've got to always respect uh, the privacy and right of an American citizen. Uh, but I think, I think they ought to take a hard look now at whether we've gone too far in denying the people that run the intelligence community uh, access to human intelligence. You know, you can tell a lot from science. When I was president during the Gulf War, they could tell me exactly how many troops were where on the front lines. They could say which direction they were moving. I remember getting a thing from Saddam Hussein uh, via Gorbachev saying, well, they're pulling out. Yeah, they're pulling out of where they were, but they were going south towards Saudi Arabia. And we could tell that from intelligence. But what we couldn't tell is the intent. And the only way you can measure intent in intelligence is if you, if you have human intelligence. If you have people that are really willing to risk their lives for a cause, and sometimes they'll risk it for noble reasons. They believe in democracy and freedom. And sometimes they risk it for uh, more selfish reasons, like money or women, or you name it. And uh, it's, it's not pleasant. But I think we're going to find that we, we have to do more in the way of human intelligence. And that means we're going to have to take a broad look at exactly what constraints the intelligence community, not just CIA, but the community itself, is operating under. And I think you're. I think it's important to recognize that all this new internet technology that you guys know so much about has to be reviewed, in a sense, to see whether we're constraining our intelligence communities from, from uh, getting after the culprits that may be American citizens. It's not pleasant, but I believe strongly we need to strengthen our, our intelligence. We got the best intelligence system in the world. Our president gets better intelligence, I think, than the prime minister of England, president of Israel, prime minister, whatever. But um, it's, it's, we still need to strengthen it, and I think you're going to see, uh, see a little effort to do that. Um, the world we live in today is very different than what it was when this week began. Very different indeed. And we should make sure that these agencies responsible for protecting American citizens against terror are not forced to fight this critical battle with one arm tied behind them. Um, having said all that, the topic at hand today is the energy business. And though it seems like a million years since I was out there in the business trenches, like you all, all are, uh, following a dream, working to build something with my career, I always enjoy the opportunity to visit with executives uh, who lead dynamic companies, who work with and for dynamic companies, particularly in the industry where I spent some 17 years. Lodestar provides a very valuable service uh, to the, to the uh, uh, energy industry. I know that, and my friends in that business know that too. I left the oil business, what, 36 years ago, but my interest has never diminished. In many ways, in fact, it intensified during my public service because what so many companies like the ones that you, some of you represent here today uh, do have a direct effect on our country's national security as well as our vital strategic interests around the world. Interesting transition here as we now just I pipe down for a second. Former President Bush's audio, the 41st president on the right-hand part of your screen, you're seeing the arrival of the 43rd president, his son. President George W. Bush, he is arriving at Washington Hospital Center. He had mentioned this when we were listening in earlier when he was talking to uh, Mayor Giuliani and Governor Pataki. He's going there today to visit victims recovering from the plane crash into the Pentagon on Tuesday, doing that to show his support and wish them well. We'll keep that picture up and we'll bring the sound back up on former, on former President Bush. Right now. The guy in the back jumped up and said, yeah, if you weren't president, I'd be buying stock right now. So I, I'm not going to try to, 
I'm not going to tell you guys how to run your business or what Chris ought to be doing differently. But I have to say, I was fascinated in doing a little homework uh, to learn. What we will get back to the comments of former President Bush in just a minute, but we do want to go to this picture live. Once again, this is the arrival of the current President Bush, his son, President Bush, arriving at Washington Hospital Center. He had mentioned this earlier. He's showing up here to show his support for those that survived the plane crash into the Pentagon on Tuesday and are at this hospital recovering from their injuries. Yeah, we just heard the former President Bush pretty much get to the end of his remarks about this, uh, this current situation. He's calling it a new era as far as uh, the U.S. Uh, is concerned. And as we're seeing now, the former mid uh, President George W. Bush is about to get out of the vehicle, and I think he may have already gotten out of it. Let's go ahead and bring in our Kelly Wallace, who's standing by at the White House. Kelly, the president mentioned earlier that he was coming here to show his support. Of course, he can't, he can't visit everybody in the hospital who's recovering from the tragedy of Tuesday. No, exactly, Darren. You heard him say he wishes he could comfort every family, every family and every victim of this tragedy. The president going to this hospital, I believe the first lady expected to join the president here to visit with victims of, of course, the crash into the Pentagon. And also the president wanting to thank all the doctors and nurses who have been working very hard pulling in overtime hours, really doing everything they can to help the victims and comfort them. Darren, I was just struck as we listened to the former president just about sort of the, the similarities here. There's just so much to talk about. You know, the former president saying that he talks to his son quite regularly. He said, well, he's been doing that since George W. Bush has been a little boy, and so he's going to continue that. He says they don't always talk about policy very much. Sometimes it's just sort of a close family staying in touch, but we do know that the president... Kelly, let me interrupt there. you just for a second yeah. because there we see um, President and Mrs. Bush as they go ahead and, and walk into the hospital. But I, I did pick up on the same thing as, as you were saying that he was talking about his relationship, father and son, former president, current president, and also as he was make, re, making his remarks, as he was making remarks that the former president, you reminded the wealth of experience that former President Bush has as head of the intelligence community, as an ambassador, as vice president under President Reagan, and of course as president. He has to be an enormous resource, not just for the country, but especially for his son. Exactly, and we've always asked, we just asked Ari Fleischer, in fact, yesterday, because we know that the president did talk with his father on Tuesday aboard Air Force One. That was after, I believe, certainly some of the attacks were already underway. The White House never commenting exactly on the sort of subject of the conversation to say sometimes the president talks to his father as a father and sometimes mm -hmm. more for advice. But just as you're mentioning, you have the former president, many of the top officials in his administration who handled the Persian Gulf War. His defense secretary, Dick Cheney, serves as the president's vice president. And of course, Colin Powell, who is now, of course, the secretary of state. And there are just a lot of similarities. You heard the former president say that his son his administration is trying to build an international coalition and that after the U.S. does that, the president will determine what to do. Well, there have been a lot of uh, comparisons made with the international coalition that the former president put together to, of course, deal with the Persian Gulf War and Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. Another similarity in terms of going to Congress, and you even heard the former president mention the importance of going to Congress, the president calling for some type of joint resolution, which would basically uh, a use of force resolution. The U.S. to retaliate for those attacks, that resolution being compared to a resolution passed by Congress in 1991 that gave his father really the authority to go ahead for force against Iraq after the invasion against Kuwait. So just so many similarities really between his father's administration and, and in a way what the president is uh, coping with right now. Darren. Kelly Walls at the White House. Kelly, thank you very much. And as you were talking, we we're seeing pictures of reporters being allowed into the hospital where the president is visiting those victims of the crash at the Pentagon. Looks like we're going to get pictures of that visit. So when we do, we'll show them to you here at CNN. All right. Well, in the meantime, let's update you on some of the major developments that we've got up to this particular hour as we bring our extensive coverage of America under attack. Now, the very latest, President Bush talked by phone to New York Governor George Pataki and Mayor Rudolph Giuliani a moment ago. Mr. Bush told them that he plans to travel to New York tomorrow. Now, when he gets there, you'll understand that New York City is uh, in the process still of recovering. They're asking now for more body bags to be brought to that city. As a matter of fact, we understand now that there are some 94 bodies that have been recovered and they've been numbered to be identified. And of that 94, 46 of them have been identified. As of now, there are 4,763 people still considered missing in New York. 
Now, authorities are saying that the number of fatalities expected at the Pentagon moving south of Washington there now uh, is around 190. That is the latest number that we have gotten from the Pentagon. They're saying now that fatalities are about 190. And according to the information that we've been told here at CNN, of that 190, the highest ranking officer is a three-star Army general in that number. Now, some of the suspected hijackers' identities are now being revealed along with where they may have gotten their aircraft training. And before we move on, I want to also advise folks about this one other note. Just as of uh, 37 minutes ago, uh, Transportation Secretary Norman Mineta announced that the airspace is going to, has been reopened. We understand now there is an, a website that you can go to to check and see if your plane, uh, if your airport rather, has been open. That is fly.faa. Gov. I've been, I just checked it a second ago, and I, as I counted, there are almost 70 airports that have been cleared, saying that the airport security there has been certified and is now operationally available. Right, and once again, uh, that website, fly.faa.gov, very important to remember the, the dot between the fly and the right. FAA. That's one thing. There's a look at it right there, and, and we'll keep track of that as well. We also have people stationed at airports throughout the country. We're watching it for you as well. The airspace is reopening, as Leon mentioned, as we heard the Transportation Secretary mention earlier. This is a slow process, folks. It is not going to be at full speed. Let's take a look at airports around the country. LaGuardia was one of the first ones to open. We've been hearing uh, different reports that it was open, then it wasn't open. So once again, before you head down to LaGuardia or any other airport, you want to go ahead and call ahead or check a website. Let's check the middle of the country, Detroit. Metropolitan Airport is one of the many airports that has received approval of its stepped-up security. The FAA's new restrictions apply not only to airports, but also to airlines and to passengers. It is going to be a new way to travel. LaGuardia, I just checked. Mm -hmm. LaGuardia is on the fly.faa.gov list as being open as right open. now. Okay. All right. New York City took a double hit in Tuesday's horrific attacks. You know that by now. But looking there now, we see rescuers digging round the clock through the mounds of steel and concrete that were once the 110-story twin World Trade Center towers. The rescuers are searching now for survivors. And in many cases, they're finding only body parts. New York's mayor says 4,763 people have been reported missing. And thousands, thousands of body bags have been made available. Attorney General John Ashcroft says the hijackers who steered the planes into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon had been trained as pilots in the U.S. and had significant ground support. We we're talking about the Pentagon, a live picture now right at the crash site where that plane plowed in to the center of the military. We were just talking about that because of President Bush paying a visit to many of the victims that were injured in that crash. As Leon was mentioning, authorities expect the uh, number of fatalities right now, their current number to be around 190. That includes those killed aboard the jetliner that slammed into the building on Tuesday. The bodies of the Pentagon will be taken to Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. The remains are expected to begin arriving at Dover sometime this afternoon. Meanwhile, the Pentagon is open and they've asked uh, employees to report for work there. And as uh, Leon also mentioned so far, the highest ranking officer that, we're heard of, that we have heard of so far that has lost his life, a three-star general, although we do not have an identification yeah. on that general yet. Army general. Yes. We Army do general. know that much, yeah. yes. Now, a candlelight vigil was held last night in Washington as people there and across the country mourn those killed at the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and that plane crash in Pennsylvania as well. Let's not forget that scene. For many New Yorkers, the grief and the shock is, is incomprehensible. Hundreds of New Yorkers turned out for a vigil last night. Such memorials were also held in towns and cities from coast to coast across the country. From Washington, D.C., we want to go to the uh, other side, of course, that we've been covering in this New York City. Our Paula Zahn and Aaron Brown standing by there. They're actually on the street. Um, a building here in Midtown Manhattan has been evacuated because of what's being described as an unspecified bomb threat. I can tell you because I just by happenstance happened to be in that building that the evacuation itself was extremely orderly. People certainly were afraid. There was some crying going on. People in the city is really tense because of what's gone on since Tuesday. But the evacuation itself moved very slowly, very carefully, and very thoughtfully. Police are working the building to try and find out if there's anything to this threat at all. But this building has been evacuated. We went through a very similar thing, Paula, when you and I were on the air last night when Penn Plaza was evacuated in, and in roughly the same area. Building. 
And it's interesting. I was on the air when this evacuation came down. Uh, Governor Pataki and Mayor Giuliani were just wrapping up their news conference, and we got a signal from a producer who came out to the platform and says, you guys got to shut this down now. Uh, the immediate response of most of us trying to get, you know, I've been in this building for three days. I needed help finding the, the stairwell. Uh, we all got on our cell phones, and I think we had the same response that, that many of the folks did in the World Trade Center. You want to establish contact with your family, which I did. I called my husband, let him know what floor we were on, and uh, I would describe it as just as orderly as you did. Uh, I, unfortunately, um, as you reported last night at 10:15, this may become a way of life of these, well, these bomb threats that, that are not credible. Uh, well, at the, and, and five minutes, I will tell you, five minutes before we were evacuated, I had just reported that LaGuardia International Airport had been evacuated. Now, I don't know what has transpired in the 20 minutes since we left the set, if there was a credible bomb threat there or not. In any case, this, the building has been evacuated. Everything's fine. Police are working the problem. Uh, there were two, I'm just being told this, so bear with me, you guys, two phone calls to two separate firms. Um, and the building made a decision to evacuate, and nobody's quarreling with that decision, not in this city, not these days, not given what has happened. Back to you guys. All right, thank you very much, Aaron and Paula. I don't think they can hear us while they're on the street there, but I do want to say most important to be safe and, of course, follow any directions as uh, we... We try to get through this. Erin Brown and Paula Zahn. Paula also mentioned that she had heard that uh, LaGuardia was shut down. Uh, the latest information we're getting is that LaGuardia is operational. But once again, we encourage you either to call ahead to the airline or check on the internet before you head down to the airport. And when you do, of course, patience is a key. Yeah, Leon. and that's just what we did, check the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, the FAA has set up a website for those of you who are concerned about the airport that you need to be going to or getting away from. Uh, the website is, the address is www.flyfly.faa.gov. Now, I've just checked that website, and I just noticed that uh, Dallas-Fort Worth DFW is not on the list. We have our Ed Lavendera standing by there now live. Let's go check in with him. Ed, what are you seeing and hearing there? Well, Leon, just a, a few, about an hour ago, we spoke with officials here at DFW Airport, and they had told us that the FAA had certified all of the uh, security arrangements that they've made over the last 48 hours. We were told by the airport here that uh, we can expect flights to start resuming later on this afternoon. You can see here at uh, one of the terminals at American Airlines. Of course, American Airlines uh, corporate headquarters are located here in the Fort Dallas-Fort Worth area. A lot of folks here are starting to make their arrangements uh, to try to uh, get to their destinations. A lot of people who were en route had to stop here. Some 900 passengers, we understand, uh, were uh, put up in accommodations here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. But as far as we understand, uh, DFW airport officials anticipating about 30 flights to arrive around the 1 o'clock hour. And uh, from there, they're also anticipating uh, to, for flights to start taking off from here later on this afternoon. But all of that hinges as well on the airports that these planes will be flying to, depending on what the security situations are at all of those airports. Of course, they have to be able to fly from one secure airport to another, and all of these airports have to be certified by the FAA. And that's what we're being told here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We've got one passenger here that we've uh, been speaking to with this morning, uh, Hovev Iran, and he lives in Israel, uh, got stuck here in Dallas here on business you're trying to get home uh, what uh, kind of obstacles are you running into what are your plans the obstacles first of all with the two days the desperate uh, thing to try to raise flights from uh, my hotel which was impossible so I came over here and uh, over here I gave uh, together with the American airline agent we tried to find all the options going through Europe Mexico Canada and 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 in the meanwhile uh, they arranged for me the afternoon flights to uh, LaGuardia and from here, there, I can hit Europe or any destination that will get me close to my last destination. So uh, I think that my decision to come to the airport and uh, hop to the first plane that goes into the, some kind of my direction was correct, because uh, you can't do that from home or you can't do that on the telephone. You have to wait three hours for them and they will answer you. And after they answer you, they can't do anything about it. Yeah, like I said, you're trying to get to Israel. Are yeah. you concerned at all, given the situation and what you've seen in the last 48 hours? Or are you worried at all about traveling? I think that's going to be kind of the big issue here. I'm not worried about traveling because I'm worried about driving more than traveling. It's statistics. Flying is, is safer than anything else in the world. And uh, it's, of, of course, there was a big trauma here. But if you look in the reality, driving to the airport is more dangerous. So I don't think people should be afraid of flying. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's more scary because it's flying and in the air and it's movies and it's drama. But uh, I think that's one of the safest places that you can be is in the airplanes still. When you heard what happened uh, on Tuesday, what went through your mind? 
it was a there's no words it, it, it's a shock it's hard to understand it i don't think that anybody still understands it it'll take time to understand the issue all right thank you very much we got to toss it back to atlanta leon back to you all right thank you very much ed lavendera in dallas we'll get back to you later on what are you there yeah we want to take our, our viewers live to uh, shanksville pennsylvania our brian cabell is standing by this of course is the site where united airlines flight 93 crashed on its way from Newark to San Francisco crashed on Tuesday and I understand in this investigation there's some breaking news. Brian, what can you tell us? Well, Darren, in the last hour or so, the FBI and the state police here have confirmed that they have cordoned off a second area about six to eight miles away from the crater here where this plane went down. This is apparently another debris site which raises a number of questions. Why would debris from the plane, and they identified it specifically as being from this plane, why would debris be located six miles away? Could it have blown that far away? Seems highly unlikely. Almost all the debris found at this site is within 100 yards, 200 yards away. So it raises some questions. We don't want to over speculate, of course, but, uh, but there were some cell phone callers, one cell phone caller in particular, who said he saw a bomb or something that looked like a bomb with one of the hijackers also, the man who took over the plane apparently, uh, announced that at one point he had there was a bomb on board the plane so again we don't want to speculate we don't want to jump to conclusions but what we do know is that there is a site about a half mile behind me where the plane went down where most of the debris is and then about six miles away up by a lake there is another area that's been cordoned off hmm. and state police and the FBI have said definitely there is debris from the plane located there we have a crew on the way right now we should have pictures of that a little bit later on in the meantime the search here goes on 80 searchers going foot by foot, combing the area, looking for evidence they have not yet found the black box. Darren? Which, which was my first question, so I'll move on to my next one, Brian. We don't want to speculate about this uh, large debris field, but it seems to me from covering a number, number of plane crashes on, on the scene that, if nothing else, you can say this is not typical for a plane crash to be spread across an area this large. It certainly doesn't make sense because most of the, the debris has been found in a very compact area within 100 yards, 200 yards, maybe a little beyond that. And then all of a sudden they're telling us six miles away they have another concentration of debris. They say it's very small pieces. Most of these are very small pieces. Most of the pieces here are no bigger than the size of a briefcase, they say. Mm -hmm. And the pieces six miles away may be even smaller than that. They have talked to a number of individuals here. They say they have talked to people who saw this plane during the final moments. They haven't confirmed whether they saw uh, they talked to anybody who saw this plane actually land or crash rather and as to whether it broke up on the way we don't know that fbi is being very tight-lipped about that but again it leads to that possibility it certainly leads to a number of questions you mentioned they have yet to find the black box it would seem to me when you compare the four plane crashes of tuesday this would be the site where they would be most likely to find a black box that's what they told us initially, and I think they're, they're somewhat disappointed they haven't found it. It's been 48 hours, but they are still hopeful they will find it. There is a pond nearby this particular site. They may have to send divers into the pond. They haven't done that yet, but conceivably it could be in the pond. It could be anywhere. It could be at this other debris site. They, they've also found some other debris scattered around this area. They say, in fact, some individuals have been collecting it. Again, we're talking about very, very tiny parts. The biggest part they found at this site is an engine an engine part and most of the other pieces are probably no bigger than this particular yeah. notebook. So again, very small pieces. They had hoped to find the black box by now. They're still voicing optimism. They will find it. It's, it's not an assignment I would wish on anybody, but I would say that you would have to have an assignment like that to appreciate what that looks like when a plane comes crashing into the ground and basically just drops out of the sky. Brian Cabell in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, thank you very much. Also a note from yesterday when we were listening into an FBI news conference, they were saying they expect this search just at this site to take about three to five weeks. So they are going to be very deliberate and look for every possible piece of evidence. Brian, thank you very much. Sure. Leon. Well, in the meantime, uh, the country and the air industry in particular is trying to at least get somewhat back to normal. It's been some 51 minutes now since airports around, uh, certain airports around the country that have met certain security uh, guidelines have been cleared to begin operations again. One of the busiest in the world is Atlanta's Hartsfield International Airport, and we would assume that that airport would be one, among the first to begin the process of getting back online. Let's check in now with our Bonnie Anderson, who's standing by there at Hartsfield. Bonnie? Well, Hartsfield is officially open. Earlier today, the uh, officials removed tape that was across the fronts of the doors. They notified their concessionaires and they alerted all of the airlines. We're going to try to show you some uh, pictures now of planes on the tarmac if we can. First flight out will be, oh, in about five, ten minutes. It's a South African Airways flight to South Africa. 
Delta, which is headquartered here and the largest carrier at this airport, is first expecting to bring in planes that were diverted to Canada. They then plan to reposition the aircraft across the nation and then begin limited flights uh, later this afternoon. We're told Continental and American, however, will not have any service out of Atlanta, but those things can change. Joining me now is the airport's general manager, Ben DaCosta. Given the fact that there's still some uncertainty in which planes and which airlines will be flying, what would you tell passengers to do? The most important thing for passengers to do is to call their airlines and confirm that their flight is flying. Many of the airlines that would be scheduled um, will not fly today. And so the ramp up nationwide will have limited flights. And in terms of what they will need to get out on the concourse, we must have a confirmed ticket, correct? We want passengers to call their airlines. Um, many of them will have e-tickets. When you get to the airport, they will we'll discover there's no curbside check-in. And they'll have to go to the ticket counters to, in order to get a boarding pass, in order to get through checkpoint security. So no one without a boarding pass will be allowed out. Family members can't go out on the concourse. With the one exception, if you have a child that is flying alone, a parent, one parent, can accompany the child uh, to the gate area. Now you have said that you don't want to talk about any specifics about security here. We do know that uh, Hartsfield has always had a very multi-layered system, especially following the Olympics. Is it fair to say, though, that the new precautions have been taken? We have uh, spent the last two days making sure that we are completely secure and safe and have implemented every one of the FAA's uh, instructions. Well, thank you very much for joining us. So within about uh, five, ten minutes, the first flight out of Hartsfield should be taken to the air. Uh, no word, though, it's a little bit uncertain yet how long it will take for all of the airlines here to uh, get back to absolute full operation. I'm Bonnie Anderson, CNN reporting live from Atlanta. All right, thank you very much, Bonnie Anderson. Now, let's go up to New York. CNN's Michael Oku has been spending quite a bit of time out there this morning out in the streets and has been showing us some incredible pictures there, which give you a very, very good idea of the, of the kind of heat, the kind of devastation that blasted through that area. Michael? Hi, Leon. Um, you know, I'm standing just a few blocks north of, of uh, what was the World Trade Center, Ground Zero. And all morning, we've been bringing you horrific pictures uh, that give you a sense of just how devastating the impact might have been felt by individuals who were in the area at the time. Certainly the impact was felt by some of the cars that you see here that were at the scene. And rescue workers have been pulling uh, the wreckage away from Ground Zero in order to continue their work. And this area, which was uh, this morning of uh, particular interest to us journalists, has also become something of a shrine. Uh, a woman who has spent uh, uh, many years here, she's been a resident since 1976, came out this morning with a handful of flowers and she distributed them on top of each one of these cars. You can see how devastating the impact was. And you can see just, if you go over this way, William, and, and, and get a sense of some of the neighbors here who are checking out the impact, you can see everyone who has come by here this morning uh, sort of meets this scene with, uh, with a degree of incredulity. People, I think, didn't really quite understand just how devastating the impact was here until they saw something, something, anything, that came from what was essentially ground zero. Um, this is a neighborhood, I should tell you, that has experienced a lot in the last couple of years, just about a block or two away from here, is where John F. Kennedy Jr. lived. And you can remember that um, uh, this was the site of a memorial to, uh, to Mr. Kennedy, and now, of course, it's become a memorial to those people who might not have lived um, after the attack. Now, what you're looking at here is obviously the hollowed out cavity of once, what, what was once a, 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 a police car, uh, probably a car driven by a detective, not one of those uh, um, recognizable police cars. And this is, this is a vehicle that must have been someplace near Ground Zero at the time. There's no indication as to whether these vehicles were vehicles that were driven down there once rescue workers and police officers and other law enforcement officials heard about what had happened here and tried to arrive on the scene to try to, try to help people out. Um, but if, in fact, that did happen, you can see that um, there was a terrifically awful impact. Just across the street here, 
you're looking at what was once a van uh, used by Con Edison, which of course is the utility company that supplies much of Manhattan and uh, much of New York with, um, with, with energy and other utilities. And again, you can see journalists and some neighbors around the area taking pictures and I think taking stock of what's happened in the past 48 hours. This entire neighborhood has been shut down essentially from 14th Street, which is just some blocks north of us, throughout the course of Lower Manhattan. It's pretty much been like a ghost town. And again, the neighbors here, it's not just a financial district, but it is actually a neighborhood. Uh, they've experienced a lot. In many of the buildings that you see around me, there's been some structural damage. And in those buildings that even haven't sustained structural damage, uh, there's often no electricity. I spent the night in a building here uh, that had uh, absolutely no hot water. Um, so yes, there are plenty of people who are suffering uh, gravely as a result of this. And the impact was felt far beyond uh, what you might call the epicenter. Leon? Uh, Michael, I'm wondering, did you get a chance to talk with any of the, the, the residents of the neighborhoods and, and have them tell you exactly where they were and, and, and what they felt like and what they thought when, when the whole thing first started coming crashing down? Absolutely. In fact, the woman who came here, the, this resident against it I mentioned, who uh, has been living here since 1976, she came out with an armful of flowers and she said she was actually standing on her roof after the first plane had made impact. And they were looking at the World Trade Center incredulously, as everybody was. I remember watching uh, from the confines of the comfort of my home. Um, and she said that when she saw the second plane go into the second tower, she was completely devastated. And she said she felt complete and total powerlessness. Hmm. And she said part of the reason why she came out here with, um, with her flowers was because she wanted to take the opportunity now that essentially ground zero had been brought to her, to her doorstep, to um, maybe change this powerlessness into a feeling of, uh, of humanity, is what she said. I want to take this powerlessness and remind ourselves that we are actually human. Hmm. One, Michael, one final question, if I can, quickly. I notice you're not wearing the mask now. Does that mean that uh, the air situation down there has been has been cleared out for a, a wider area or for the whole area or what? Well, I should tell you, I don't know whether it's, it's, it's that smart of me not to wear the mask. As soon as we get off the air, I'm going to put the mask back on. Um, I haven't talked to any uh, local officials here to find out exactly whether the levels in the air are safer than they were before. But the fact is that after a while, it does feel a lot more comfortable here. Hmm. Earlier this morning, when we saw great dark plumes of smoke um, emanating from the hot center 